Uh, do, do, do. Let's get our schedule on the board. Uh, so today is uh, Wednesday and it is October 20th, 2021. Today we start our discussion of the muscle system. Um, and we will do that by talking uh, first about the muscle tissue, anatomy. We'll continue that in lab when we start talking about our muscle anatomy and our study guides, the handouts that we're gonna be working on and doing. So we're gonna do that. We've got a bunch of assignments due. Uh, starting on Monday, uh, which is the 25th, uh, you have a labster due. And that one is on muscle tissue. A great uh, uh, review of the material we're covering today. And again, remember you have to have those 100% complete uh, and 80% correct or full credit on that. Uh, we do have class on uh, Wednesday, October 27th, but we don't have any assignments due which kind of makes that a good day for a daily quiz. Uh, but the next homework assignment is going to be due on the 1st of November, uh, the following Monday, and that is your unit view, view 10, um, which is pages 281 through 288. Wednesday that week, Uh, you had so much fun doing it the first time. I'm going to let you do another physio X exercise. This one is exercise two. And because I know you couldn't get enough in the last one, thankfully, this one actually has more activities, a total of uh, seven activities uh, that are due for that. And again, remember, for each of those, you get your own lab report. Uh, so seven lab reports that you'll uh, thankfully not have to print out, but can just submit onto um, uh, Canvas. And then on Monday, the 8th, uh, you have two assignments due. Your unit 11 review, uh, which is... Um, pages 307 through 312. And you have a muscle activity handout. We'll talk about this a lot more in a lab today when we get to the lab part. Um, and this one is also kind of like our skeletal review we just had. This is gonna be graded for correctness. All leading up into Wednesday, 11.10, where we have our, uh, our lab and lecture exam. I believe this is our first Wednesday exam. So one of the important things to remember about a Wednesday exam is twofold. That means the weekend of the 6th and 7th is your last big weekend to study for this material. And that also means you're getting new material on the 8th, two days before the exam. Now I will try to front load it as much as possible so there isn't too much new information on the 8th, but I'll remind you that you have the lecture slides and the outlines and uh, everything else to help you to be prepared to know what to expect. So I fully expect you to look ahead at that material so that the material that we cover on Monday the 8th is more of a review uh, for you, and it shouldn't be the first time you're looking at and thinking about that information. And I'll remind you of those things as we get closer to that as well. All right, so that is the game plan for this section. Any questions on any of that? Excellent. You know how much I love my uh, stunned silences first thing in the morning, so that does make me incredibly happy. All right, excellent. My stuff is working. You can at least hear me and see me, right? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right, then let's dive into the muscular system. 
Again, we know there are three tissue types in the body. There are epithelial tissues, connective tissues, nervous tissues, and our fourth type, the type that we're gonna start talking about today, muscle tissue, all right? What do muscle tissues do for us? Let's, we, we've talked about this a little in the past, but let's be more specific now. What is it that our muscle tissues do for us? Give me an example. Uh, flexion and extension. Excellent. Okay, so I like both of those things. When we do think of things like flexion and extension, abduction, adduction, all of those things, movements, that's one of the big key things. And in this case, we're talking about movements through space. Absolutely. So absolutely, the ability to basically use the skeletal system, use them as levers uh, to move the body through space. Oops, don't need to write through twice. So absolutely, that is an example of a movement uh, that our body allows, our muscle tissue allows. Are there any other movements that our muscle tissue allows? Think of it this way. If I stand here with my arms out and I hold my breath and I close my eyes, is there any movement going on in my body if I do that? Absolutely. Excellent. We have things like the heart. We have um, pumping the blood through my body. We have things like the stomach working on the cheeseburger that I had for breakfast. Absolutely. So when we think of movements, not only do we have the movement of the body through space, but we also have movement of substances through the hollow organs of our body. like blood through our cardiovascular system, like food through our digestive system. And how is it that our muscle tissue is able to move substances through the hollow organs of our body? Uh, peristalsis, I think it's called. Excellent, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Uh, our, our smooth muscle makes rhythmic contractions uh, of the smooth muscle layers of those hollow organs at a process that is called peristalsis. Absolutely. Peristalsis is an important process that is that movement. And what peristalsis actually does is it changes the volume of our organs. If you change the volume of our organs, what else do you change? What makes the world go round? Pressure. 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 Absolutely. Changes the pressure. And those pressure changes is what moves substances through the body. So those pressure changes move the substances through our body. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, I also saw someone wrote earlier that another important function of muscle tissue is to help to regulate body temperature. How does our muscles do that for us? Reduce heat rate or transfer like heat to either like shiver or uh. yeah no you're absolutely correct it, you're right when we get cold one of the things that happens is we shiver mm -hmm. and that shiver generates heat the reason for this is our muscle tissue contains motors anyone know what a motor is gonna have to work on my examples because normally we're sitting in the classroom and I was all you know most of you got here today because of motors right but now most of you got here today because you happen to be laying in bed so what is a motor makes your car work or run or... yeah you've absolutely got the right idea what a motor actually does is a motor converts chemical energy into mechanical energy like you mentioned, with that motor in your car, it takes the gasoline and it converts it into propulsion that moves your car through space. Muscle tissue does the same thing. With muscle tissue, of course, that uh, chemical energy is ATP. And then again, it moves our body through space. Now, after your car has driven you to work or driven you to grandma's house, you're of course very thankful for its motor. So what you do is you give your car a big hug and you lay your face right on the hood of your car, right? 
Is that what you do when you get to your destination? How many people lay their faces right on the, uh, the hood of their car when they get to their destination? No, because it's hot. Yeah, exactly. Because while motors convert chemical energy into mechanical energy, they're not 100% efficient. And much of the energy is lost as heat. Some of the muscles that we contract when we're shivering, when we're cold, right? Their process of converting chemical energy into mechanical energy, as much as 75% of that energy is lost in the form of heat. Now, would you want a car engine where 75% of the energy from your gasoline was lost in the form of heat instead of moving you forward? No. No, absolutely not. But for our muscles, it's okay because it plays an important role in helping us to regulate our body temperature. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Excellent. All right, that's two things. What else does our muscle tissue do for us? Supports our joints. Yeah. Right. Again, as I was talking about standing here with my arms out and my eyes closed and holding my breath, I'm not moving physically in space, but there are a whole lot of muscle contractions that are taking place that are about helping to support and maintain my body posture and my joints. Right. When you're in class writing furiously, right, like and for me, I'd be uh, writing on the board with my left hand while I'm writing on the board with my left hand is my right shoulder slowly sinking out of its joint cavity uh, while I'm not using it. No, no, of course not, because those joints are held in place by muscles, a little bit of muscle tone. And standing here without moving with my eyes closed, right, is something that ability to maintain our posture is something we take for granted, right? If I had had that fifth shot of Jaeger this my, the, the Jaegermeister this morning, instead of stopping at just four, right, I might be a little tipsy. And if I was a little tipsy, would I be as easy for me to be able to maintain that posture and hold my position in space? No. No, we take for granted how many small little minor contractions are taking place in our body to maintain that posture, to keep us upright. It's not moving us through space, but it's stabilizing us and holding us in place. And that is something that is very important as well. Kind of along with that is that muscle tone, that muscle tension provides protection, right? We've talked about how the cranial cavity protects the brain, or we have the ribs that protect our heart and our lungs. But most of the organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity, what protects them? Muscle. Muscle, right? Yeah, there's a couple things that are able to sneak up underneath the ribs a little bit because of the curvature of our diaphragm. But most of the organs in the abdominal cell pelvic cavity don't have bony protection around them. So instead, what we have is multiple layers of muscles at different orientations forming actually what we call a girdle helping to provide that protection, right? In fact, that's how Houdini died. Houdini, as I'm sure you know, is a, a very famous escape artist. And he would put on these shows in the theaters where he would you know, have the big milk uh, uh, crate, or not crate, but the milk bottle thing that he would uh, you know, submerge himself upside down and get out of a straight jacket and do all these things. And he would do two or three of these escapes typically in a show and they take a long time to set up. So he would have other smaller acts that would uh, take place in between. So he'd do one of his big routines and then a bunch of other people would come out and perform while they set up for his next routine. Well, one of the things that he would do in the time in between is he would come up on stage and to show his masculinity and to show his strength and stamina and all of that, he would encourage people in the audience to come up and punch him in the stomach as hard as he could. And people would line up 10 deep to come up and punch him in the stomach and he'd laugh at them and mock them and you know the crowd would go crazy and laugh and and all these things and because he had such great constitution and straight such great core strength he was able to contract his his uh, abdominal girdle and pr protect himself well 
One day after a show, he was walking into a bar where a couple college kids who had been at the show the night before saw him. And without saying anything and without uh, any warning at all, they came up and punched him three or four times in the stomach. Right. Now, of course, when he's on stage and was prepared, he was able to engage his abdominal girdle, his core muscles, and be able to protect himself. But when you're just randomly walking into a bar, are you ready and prepared for such a thing? No. no. And he ended up, they ended up rupturing his spleen, and he died like three days later. So basically, Houdini died from an unprotected blow to the stomach, uh, which, again, shows you this importance of the protection of the internal organs. Excellent. Any others? I can actually think of one more good one. On your list, it says nutrient reserve. Yeah, what the heck does that mean? It stores nutrients. It does store nutrients. There's a massive amount of not just nutrients, but in particular proteins in muscles, right? But there's a lot of proteins in a lot of cells. So what makes our muscle a nutrient reserve? Well, again, I know it was, or is, you know, it was like 30 degrees this morning when I woke up, or at least it felt that way. It's been super cold the past couple of days, but as it always occurs, right around the corner is going to be another summer and another bikini season. And so getting ready for bikini season, you know, the perfect thing to do is to go on the popcorn diet where you have one piece of popcorn for breakfast, one piece of popcorn for lunch, and a reasonable three pieces of popcorn uh, for dinner. Now, if I do that in preparation of wearing my bikini, am I going to lose weight as a result of that? Technically. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Eating five pieces of popcorn a day is not going to give me the caloric intake uh, that I need to be able to maintain activities in my body. Basically, I'll be starving myself. However, when you're starving yourself, is that when the fat just melts off your body? No. No. In fact, the opposite is true. When your body goes into starvation mode, uh, fat is a valuable resource. It is stored energy, it's insulation, it's protection. And so your body actually holds on to that, doesn't like to let go of the fat. Instead, there's this perfectly good muscle over here that is just chock filled with all the amino acids and the other things that I need. So when you starve yourself, you're actually more likely to lose muscle mass than you are actually to lose adipose as a result of that. So it is a tissue. Uh, one of the things they talk about with muscles all the time is use it or lose it, right? Uh, and again, may, hopefully you haven't starved yourself, but maybe you broke an arm and you had it in a cast. And six months later, when you took the cast off, when you compared your two forearms to each other, did they look the same? No. No because the one that's been in the cast where you haven't been able to move, use those muscles, those muscles had broken down their proteins, they're not being used, and those nutrients are being used by other parts of the body where it is being function, uh, where that is being functional. So yeah, muscle is a very dynamic tissue that can be rapidly and easily broken down uh, for resources when needed. Excellent. So that, we've written it out, but here are the pretty words for those six functions of muscle tissue. All right. Excellent. All right, now, uh, here, let's do this here. How many types of muscle tissue are there? Four. Four, what is the fourth? Well, give me, let's list them all. What okay. are the muscle, what are the muscle tissue types? Smooth? Skeletal. Skeletal. And cardiac. cardiac. And cardiac. Excellent. Excellent. So we have three main types of muscle tissue, smooth, skeletal, and cardiac. And they're all muscle tissues. Now, if you remember, when we talked about epithelial tissues, there are eight different types of epithelial tissues. And we talked about all the characteristics that they share. 
obviously there's differences between a simple columnar epithelial tissue and a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, but as epithelial tissues, there are characteristics that they share. And the same thing's true here. Are there differences between smooth muscle, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But there are also, because they're muscle tissues, there are some characteristics, in fact, four characteristics that they all share in common. The first of those is that muscle tissue is irritable. What does it mean to be irritable? I know most Giants fans are pretty irritable right now, but what does it mean to be irritable? Like easily annoyed. Okay. Yeah, I, I, actually, I like both of those. If you put those two together, that's almost the perfect definition. Absolutely. Irritable basically means that when you receive a stimulus, you respond to it. Again, like I said, Giants fans with the Dodgers winning last night uh, can be pretty frustrated. But my favorite example of irritability is my grandmother. My grandmother was one of the sweetest, nicest, most adorable women you could ever possibly meet, except when her stories were on TV. When her stories were on TV, you did not uh, interrupt grandma. You did not make a noise. You did not upset grandma. You did not take away from her experience of watching her stories. If you were over in the corner talking while she was watching her stories, right? You talking was a stimulus and she would respond. She would take off her shoe and she would throw it at you, right? And so that's what it means to be irritable, to be able to receive a stimulus and respond to it. Now, the question with muscle tissue is how does it respond? And muscle tissue responds by producing a big electrical signal. This big electrical signal has a fancy name. Anyone know the fancy name of this big electrical signal that is produced by these muscle tissues? ATP or? ATP is what we use for energy, but in this case, it's a big electrical signal. Mm -hmm. Not the neural. Getting close with neural. It's, it's okay if you don't know, neural? we haven't talked about it yet. It's an action, action potential. potential. Yeah, there we go, an action potential. An action potential is basically a big positive signal. So since muscle tissue responds by producing this big positive electrical signal, we can also say that it's irritable or we can also say that it is electrically excitable. When is it excited? When it is excited, it produces an electrical signal. And again, that electrical signal is an action potential. Now I'm gonna sneak this in over here on the side. This is an active property. What do I mean by that? I think someone already mentioned the key to something being active earlier. What is it, it called? Energy. Yeah, energy, and in this case, ATP. The cells use ATP in this process. This is an active process. This is something that the muscle tissue does. Now, once it produces that action potential, what does that cause the muscle cell to do? Contract. Yeah, exactly. And that is the a second property of our muscle tissue, contractility. Basically, when stimulated, it changes its shape. The cell generates a force. Again, and it does that using ATP. And when it generates that force, that changes the length of the muscle tissue. Now, again, because it's using ATP, what kind of property would this be? Active. Yeah, again, this would be an active property. Excellent. Oh, I don't have a rubber band, do I? I, I know what I do have. One of these 
rubbery stretch thingies. Excellent. All right. So muscle tissue is also like a rubber band or like this little stress bungee thing. All right. When I stretch this out, does it damage it? No. 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 Now, can I stretch it to the point where it would be damaged? Yes. Yeah, probably, absolutely. But it can be stretched without being damaged. And what do we call that characteristic? Elasticity. Close. We call it extensibility. Extensibility is the ability to be stretched without damage. So this like muscle tissue can be stretched without damage. All right, think of it this way. When I flex my elbow, any idea what muscle I use to one of the muscles I use to do that? Come on, I know you know. What muscle do you use? Yeah, the bicep brachia. Use the bicep brachia, it contracts and gets smaller. And as it gets shorter, it pulls my forearm towards my head. So when I want to extend my elbow, does my bicep brachia push the arm away? No. So how do I extend my elbow? I guess I can't. I'm stuck like this forever. There we go. Mitch has got it. The tricep brachia, I contract my tricep brachia. And when I contract my tricep brachia, my elbow extends. Notice as my elbow extends, what's happening to the bicep brachia? It stretches. It stretches, it, it is stretched out and it's not damaged by that process. So one of the keys to muscles is it can be extended beyond its normal length. That's what extensibility is. without being damaged. Again, there are limits, but it can be that. Now, it with this little purple stress bungee thing, I can stretch it out without it being damaged. However, if I leave it here on the counter and I sit here and watch it for 72 days, is it ever gonna stretch out on its own? No. No. So notice this extensibility, it's not using any energy. It's not doing it itself. It's something that is done to it. And since it's something that it's done to it, where it's not using a, any ATP, would this be an active property? No. No, this would be a passive, passive. property. Right, it's something that can be done to it. It doesn't do it itself. It is done to it. It is a passive property. I have a question. I have an answer. Is the reason why it's passive is because you're using the energy to contract the muscles. So when that muscle gets e extended, the other muscles using the energy, so it's just passive? Exactly. So as we talked about in this simple example where I'm extending my elbow, you are right. The tricep brachia is the one using the energy to contract and get shorter. So the bicep brachia is changing shape. It's getting longer, but it's not using any energy to get longer. So it's basically just being stretched out by a different muscle, just like this, right? This doesn't stretch out by itself, but I can stretch it. And so I'm using my energy and it's not using any energy. It doesn't have any energy to use. By the same token, and this gets back to a comment someone said earlier, when I let go of one end, what happens to this bungee? Retracts or goes back. Yeah, it goes back to its original shape. And as someone mentioned earlier, that ability to go back to its original shape is elasticity. So after being stretched or after being condensed, so basically after being stretched or after actively getting shorter, actively contractive, the 
the muscle goes back to its original shape. And do you think it uses ATP to do that if it's elastic like this rubber band? No. no. So notice again, this is a passive property of our muscle tissue. So notice our muscle tissues have two active and two passive properties, two active and two packed, uh, passive characteristics. And again, this is true for all three types. This is true for smooth muscle, for skeletal muscle, and for cardiac muscle. This is true for all muscle types. Excellent. Questions on this? All right, excellent. If we are comfortable with the characteristics that all muscle tissue have, then we can talk about the three types of muscle tissue we have. And let's sneak to the whiteboard for this. A little easier to organize it here. What were the three types again? Smooth, skeletal, and cardiac. Excellent. Skeletal, smooth, cardiac. Oops, missed an A. Excellent. So, for each of these, let's think of some of the characteristics that we know about them. For instance, where is the location in your body where you would find skeletal muscle? On the bone. Yeah, as the name might indicate, it's gonna be attached to bones. Now, does all skeletal muscle attach to bones? No, most skeletal muscle is attached to bones. There are some, some uh, exceptions and most of those exceptions are actually on camera right now. There are small muscles uh, that connect uh, bone to skin or muscle to skin uh, in my facial region, which is what allows us to make such subtle and profound uh, facial expressions. So again, most of our muscles attach uh, to bones, but there are some that can attach to uh, muscle or can attach to even the skin as well. Skeletal muscle is our largest muscle cells of the, skele of the muscle type, largest muscle cells. Uh, some uh, skeletal muscle cells can be over a foot long in length. All right, so it's a nice long distance that these can be. And they have a cylinder shape. What does that mean? Okay, what does a cylinder mean? <laughs> Their shape is a cylinder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is a cylinder though? It's a tube, a deep. Yeah. Okay. I like that. All right. It looks like it's shaped like a Pringles can, right? This isn't a. Yeah, I'll say a can. Again, I, I know in fairness, this isn't a you know a, a geometry class, but uh, we should know what a cylinder is. It is a you know long, narrow, circular, uh, shaped cell. One of the fancy things about skeletal, and I think why someone might have said that there are four muscle tissue types is sometimes skeletal muscle tissue is referred to as being striated. So you can also hear striated muscle. What does that mean to be striated? It has lines. Yeah, it has stripes. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. So within this muscle tissue, uh, there are stripes. Turns out these stripes are due to the incredibly precise arrangement of the proteins inside of them. 
This precise arrangement of the proteins is what allows the muscle cells to be so efficient, right? If I were, for instance, to take four of you and put you into a boat and give you paddles, could you get from one side of Lake Folsom to the other? Yeah. Yeah, say not a trick question. Yes, absolutely. You should, guys should be able to do that. However, as strong and healthy and fit as all of you look, if I had you compete against a crew team, now again, assuming this is a real crew team and not Lori Lofton's kids, but against a real crew team, would you be able to beat them uh, getting from one side of the lake to the other? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. And the main oh. reason for that is that not only are they strong and are they used to rowing where you probably are not, but uh, one of the big, huge things about crew is precision. They're all dipping in their oars at the same time, pulling at the same time, rotating at the same time. And that precision, that efficiency and precision uh, dramatically increases the, uh, the effect and the strength they're able to produce. And so that's what happens here. We have such precisely arranged proteins that when they work together in uniform, we get a tremendous efficiency and a tremendous amount of strength that is produced from that. So as we'll see, these stripes are both formed by the structural, it's what gives it its stripes, but also the functional units of the muscle, which allow it to be so efficient at moving through space. Another interesting characteristic about our skeletal muscle cells is they're multinucleated. What does that mean? Multiple nucleases? Yeah, they have more than one nucleus in them, absolutely. Uh, these nuclei, what do nuclei do again? Hold our <clears throat> DNA, make protein. They hold our DNA, exactly. The instructions for making proteins. And remember, as I mentioned, this cell is just chock filled with proteins. So with these nuclei, we have lots of instructions. for making proteins. And one of the interesting things about this mix so far is that, again, these proteins are so packed in there and so tightly organized that actually there's not a lot of room for the nuclei. So the nuclei are pushed to the edge of the cell. They're not pushed out of the cell, they're still in the cell. So they would still be inside the plasma membrane. So for instance, if I were to draw the plasma membrane on this cell, they're still inside of the plasma membrane, but they're pushed to the side by all those perfectly arranged proteins. Oops, there we go. Ran out on the edge of my mouse pad, so it got a little wonky there at the end, but you understand. Uh, so again, they're push to the periphery. So we have multiple nuclei uh, pushed to the periphery. Excellent. All right, couple other key characteristics. How do we control our skeletal muscle? Our nervous system? True, our nervous system, absolutely. Well, but again, do I have, we, I, someone I saw mentioned it earlier. Do I have voluntary or involuntary control of my skeletal muscle? Voluntary. Yeah. If I want to contract my finger, I make the decision, I tell it what to do, and it moves. So it is voluntary control. You are absolutely correct. It is by the nervous system. But as we'll learn, the nervous system has different branches. And the branch of the nervous system that controls our skeletal muscle is called somatic. Som soma means body. So this is the somatic motor because it's moving our body through space. So it's a branch called the somatic motor nervous system. So we get voluntary control by that somatic motor nervous system. And lastly, for skeletal muscle, one of the things that we learned about back in the uh, second section is how tissues heal themselves. What are the two uh, healing 
uh, processes that tissues can use to heal themselves? Regeneration and fibrosis. Excellent. Regeneration and fibrosis, right? Does skeletal muscle regenerate? Yeah. Yeah. So again, if I'm lifting weights and I tear a muscle a little bit, it can repair itself and it will regenerate. However, if a shark were to take a big, huge chunk out of my shoulder, would I be able to regenerate all of that lost muscle tissue? No. No, so it is able to regenerate, but it is a limited regeneration. Oh, this should be big again. Not that big. There we go. So it, is a, it has a limited ability to regenerate. It can regenerate some. Uh, tendons and ligaments don't regenerate nearly as easily. Uh, they are much, much harder to repair. Uh, but again, we're talking about the tissue itself and not necessarily ligaments and tendons yet. But yes, typically a ligament or tendon injury uh, takes much longer to heal than a, uh, than a muscle injury does. Great point. All right. Questions on that? All right, then let's do the same thing for smooth muscle. What would you say is the location of smooth muscle? Organs. Okay, what kind of organs? The viscera. Okay, mm -hmm. visceral organs. Um, so my liver, does my liver have a lot of uh, smooth muscle in it? No. No, so what, what's a visceral organ, so why, but it, so why doesn't it have? Oh, I like digestive tract, that's definitely a part of it. Not all of it, but definitely a part of it. What's the difference between the, the stomach and the liver, for instance? Liver removes waste, and then the stomach tries to absorb the nutrients. Or okay, true. From a, you are right. From a functional amp standpoint, that is correct. Uh, you're right. The stomach contracts, whereas the liver doesn't. You guys are having the right idea. I was thinking more from a physical standpoint. Notice the big difference between one of the big differences between the stomach and the liver is, as you mentioned, the stomach is hollow. It's got space inside so that it can contract and it can move those substances, right? But it's not just the digestive tract. Our blood vessels are hollow, right? Our urinary bladder, urethra, ureters, those are hollow. So basically, smooth muscle is found in the walls of our hollow organs. Now, is that where all of our smooth muscle is found? No. No. Once again, most is found in the walls of hollow organs. Can someone give an example of smooth muscle that isn't in a hollow organ? Let me ask the question again. Can someone give me an example of smooth muscle that would not be? found inside of the walls of a hollow organ? If only in the integumentary system, we'd learned That's about cool. a way to move our hairs through space. In a cumulative class where we're responsible for this information at the end. How do you move your hair through space? It wasn't the follicle, but what moves the hair through space? Director. Rector pili muscle, absolutely excellent. So again, there are some examples where it is not in the walls of the hollow organ, like the erector pili muscle, uh, but most is in the walls of our hollow organs. Right? Uh, skeletal muscle may be the largest muscle cells. Smooth muscle are the smallest muscle cells. They also are what we call spindle shaped. Spindle shaped basically means that they have a large, oops, there we go, centrally located body and then two tapered ends. Obviously, this is not drawn to scale with my skeletal one next to it, but that's kind of what a spindle shape looks like. You've got a large centrally located body and these two tapered ends. 
Why is smooth muscle called smooth? Because it's smooth. Yes, which means that it has no stripes. So it is non-striated, no stripes. We now know that those stripes are due to proteins that help the skeletal muscle or cause the skeletal muscle to contract. If smooth muscle doesn't have stripes, that means smooth muscle must use a different method of contraction from what our skeletal muscle does. Because it doesn't have its proteins arranged in the same way. Notice also I cheated and gave it to you. This is uninucleated, which means, of course, it just has one. Um, it just has one nucleus centrally located in the center of that cell body. Um, it is typically in the walls of the hollow organs. in sheets or layers. So for instance, in our uh, small intestine, we have a circular layer that changes the diameter of the small intestine. We have a longitudinal layer that changes the length of it. And someone mentioned peristalsis earlier. That's basically what peristalsis is. It's alternating contraction. So you contract the circular and then you contract the longitudinal, squeeze and shorten, squeeze and shorten, squeeze and shorten. And as you do that to the organ, basically you move that cheeseburger through your small intestine. So again, when we see them, uh, you won't always see the spindle shape to them because they're gonna be interwoven with each other to form these layers. Now, when you have that cheeseburger for breakfast, do you have to tell your stomach to start to contract? No. No. So this is controlled involuntarily. And it is going to be controlled by what? Nervous. True. Again, it's going to be the nervous system. There we go. That was the fancy word I was looking for. The autonomic nervous system. All right. This provides that involuntary control. As you may know, your in your autonomic nervous system has two branches: your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, or what we affectionately call your rest and digest and your fight and flight. Right. So you may have heard those terms before. That gives us that involuntary control. Is there anything else that's capable of controlling our smooth muscle? Well, I'm asking the question, so the obvious answer is yes. So yes. what do you think? Yeah. If only we had another organ system that was specialized for communication that might be able to communicate with our smooth muscle. The endocrine or endocrine. And what does our endocrine system produce? Hormones. Hormones. Yeah. So our Smooth muscle can be controlled by the autonomic nervous system and by hormones. Now, what about regeneration? What do you think? Is smooth muscle able to regenerate? Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, it actually has the highest rate of regeneration of all the muscle types. Right. Obviously, clearly, epithelial tissues have the highest rate of regeneration of any tissue type. But of the muscle type, smooth muscle has the highest rate of regeneration. It's the easiest to be able to regenerate. When studying this, are we going to have to go back a few chapters from when we did like the epithelial tissues? Because I know I think in that section there was the skeletal and um, smooth and cardiac muscle like tissues slides. Um, or is it? Yeah, the, the, I'm sure, yes, I'm sure there are slides for those things there, but I also know for a fact that this section also has these slides and these pictures oh, okay. as well. So, I mean, you're welcome to go back, but uh, I don't think it's necessary. Everything you should need should be in this section of the, of the lab manual and the textbook in the, in the slides and all of that. All right, and one more to go, cardiac muscle. 
What is its location? Arts. Yeah. Mostly in the walls of the heart? Is it found anywhere else? Only in the walls of the heart? Yeah, only in this case. Yeah. Whereas there are exceptions with skeletal muscle and smooth muscle, there are no exceptions with cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is only found in the walls of the heart. Now, if skeletal is the largest and smooth is the smallest, what does that make cardiac? Middle. Yeah. It is going to be intermediate in size. And it has its own unique shape, what we call a branched shape. So again, we may have uh, my drawing tools, a centrally located portion of it, uh, but that can branch to form multiple connections with multiple other cells. So it has this branching shape to it. Not only is it kind of in between smooth and skeletal muscle in its size, it's kind of in between in its characteristics as well. Like skeletal muscle, it is striated. Meaning that it has stripes meaning that it uses the, basically the same uh, method of contraction as our skeletal muscle. Let's draw some stripes. There we go. So it has those same striations. But like our smooth muscle, it is uninucleated. And that nucleus is going to be found in the middle of the cell, not pushed to the side. So it has a single centrally located nucleus. So again, for consistency, it's uninucleated. Is the nucleus in the smooth muscle also in the center? Yes. Okay. Excellent. What about control? If I cut my hand off and I put it on the desk and I put it in a petri dish and I provide it with all the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs to stay alive. Is my hand ever going to move on its own? No. If I rip out my small intestine and I put it in a petri dish and provide it with all the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs, is it ever going to produce peristalsis on its own? No. No. But if I rip my heart out of my chest, put it in a Petri dish, provide it with all the oxygen and the nutrients that it needs, will it beat on its own? No. Yeah, it actually will. Uh, one of the special things about the heart is the heart has a special type of cell that is actually able to produce its own action potential. So it actually produces its own action potentials. We have, of course, a fancy term for this, and the fancy term for this is we say it is autorhythmic. It is autorhythmic, able to produce its own action potentials. In fact, if I were to take it and rip it out of my chest and put it into that Petri dish, it would beat at a rate of about 100 beats per minute. Now, while it's sitting in my chest right now, is it beating 100 beats per minute? No. Or in your chest? No. no. Especially not in mine because I haven't had my coffee yet this morning. But unless you've had a quad shot from Dutch Brothers, uh, you probably shouldn't probably be beating 100 beats per minute. 
So notice while it can produce its own action potentials, it's not controlled by the autonomic nervous system and hormones, but its behavior can be modified. Again, it is involuntary. We cannot say, all right, heart beat 30 beats per minute or beat 80 beats per minute, right? It is involuntary, but it is autorhythmic. It is able to produce its own action potentials. And it can be modified by, made to beat faster, made to beat slower by our autonomic nervous system and by hormones. And one more, does heart muscle regenerate? No. Exactly, no regeneration. Uh, it, it can wide. regenerate in a Petri dish though, right? I'm sorry? Can you regenerate heart from a Petri dish? No, you can grow new, well, okay, so, uh, Here's the sky's blue answer. Sky's blue answer is no. You can grow from stem cells. You could grow new heart cells, but typically heart cells do not regenerate even in a Petri dish. Now, that being said, that's our sky is blue. That's the company line that we teach in this class. There have been some really interesting studies that have come out in the past 10 years or so that has kind of put a big question mark on this. Uh, for instance, uh, with heart transplants, if um, you are, if they're not able to find the perfect heart for you for a heart transplant, but there's something close, often what they will do is what they call a piggyback surgery, where they don't actually remove your heart, they just graft the second heart in over the top of it. And that second heart basically helps your heart to function until a viable heart for transplant can occur. And there were a couple anecdotal incidents where this kind of piggyback surgery occurred. And when they went to remove the piggybacked heart, uh, the, uh, the original heart actually functioned better. You know, huh. so that maybe there was the possibility that it might have repaired itself. The other study that's interesting is back in ancient, ancient times in uh, Russia, in a place called Chernobyl, there was a big, huge uh, nuclear power plant meltdown. And a tremendous number of people and animals and wildlife were inundated with radiation. And over the many years since that has occurred, these people have been studied. Uh, the plants have been studied. The soil has been studied. They've been studying for looking at the long-term effects of radiation. Uh, and because radiation has a half-life and as that half-life goes away, you know, how's the recovery and all of that. And what they found in some scans is that the amount of radiation in the hearts of some of these people who were exposed is less than they would expect just from the decay of the half-life of the radiation. And so that may be an indication that maybe some regeneration of the tissue has taken place and that's why there's less uh, radiation than you would expect in there. So there's some really interesting studies that say that maybe the reason we say cardiac muscle doesn't regenerate is because it regenerates super slowly, or maybe there's so much stress on it that uh, until some of that stress is taken off, like with the piggyback surgery, maybe the heart would then be able to repair itself. Because as we know, mitosis requires a tremendous amount of energy, tremendous amount of resources and proteins and things along those lines. Uh, so when it's beating constantly 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it may not have the energy or the, or the time or the fuel to be able to regenerate. But again, those are speculative uh, research that is still in the early stages. And so for right now, we'll stick with the company line that uh, cardiac muscle does not regenerate. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Excellent. All right. No, it's a great question and it's a great point. Uh, but uh, often what they're looking at now to try to repair is more to uh, grow from stem cells, new cardiac tissue that could then possibly be transplanted in. So that's what they're doing now. So it's not so much regenerating as growing it from scratch. All right, excellent. So as we mentioned, 
cardiac uh, skeletal muscle located mostly connected to bones. It is striated, it is voluntary, it is multinucleated and controlled by the somatic motor nervous system. Smooth muscle again, mostly uh, lining the walls of hollow organs, non striated, involuntarily, and controlled by hormones in the autonomic nervous system. And cardiac muscle is only in the walls of the heart, striated, involuntary, uninucleated. It is autorhythmic capable of producing its own action potentials, but it can be modified, it can be influenced by hormones and the autonomic nervous system. We understand these characteristics and let's take a quick look at some of this tissue under the light microscopy. Notice here we see the portion of four, not the entire muscle cells, but here's a portion of one, here's the second, here's the third, and here's a portion of the fourth. Uh, muscle cells. So these are skeletal muscle cells. They're long cylinder in shape. And notice we can fairly clearly see that there is indeed a dark stripe and a light stripe. However, as you look a little bit closer, what should hopefully be very obvious is at the center of the light stripe is a, let's make this brighter. At the center of the light stripe is a dark line. So notice this is the whole light stripe, but there's a dark line at the center of it. And if you look really closely, you might see that there is a slightly lighter color at the center of the dark stripe. So this is the entire dark stripe, but hopefully you can see that there's a little bit of a lightness inside that. So these stripes and the little smaller stripes inside of them are again, all formed by these perfectly aligned proteins. And what I want you to pay even more attention to is notice that not only are these proteins perfectly arranged within this muscle cell, but notice they're completely coordinated with the muscle cells right next to them. So not only are the proteins in one cell lined up, but the proteins in all the cells are all perfectly aligned with each other. All right, quick quiz time. What is the shape of skeletal muscle? Cylinder. Excellent. Where is it found? Attached to, most attached to bone. Excellent. Voluntary or involuntary? Voluntary. Voluntary. Striated or unstriated? Striated. Number of nuclei, one or many? Many. Able to, re able to regenerate? Yeah. yeah, limited, but yes, absolutely. Excellent. Here is a layer of smooth muscle. Notice, as I mentioned, when they're all interdigitated with each other, it's kind of hard to see the shape of them because basically what happens is the tapered end of one lines up with the tapered end of the other, of the one next to it. And so they kind of overlap with each other, kind of like your fingers overlapping. So you can't really see the edges of them, but we know this is our smooth muscle. What shape is that? Spindle. Yeah, spindle again, a nice large centrally located body and a tapered uh, ends to it, excellent. Where is smooth muscle found? Mostly in the walls of hollow organs. Excellent. Voluntary? Involuntary. 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 Striated? Not striated. Not striated. <laughs> Excellent. Number of nuclei, one or many? One. One. Excellent. Able to regenerate? Highest rate. Yeah, absolutely. And it has the highest rate of all of them. Excellent. Lastly, we have our cardiac muscle. Uh, notice, again, what is the shape of our cardiac muscle? Branch shape. Branch shape. One of the advantages of this branching shape is notice there's a lot of space in between these cells. This space in between the cells is actually filled with a fibrous connective tissue. It actually forms what we call the fibrous skeleton 
of the heart, uh, helping to give structure and integrity to the heart. Uh, this thickens around the valves to help to hold them in place. So it isn't just the muscle that's helping this uh, function, but there's this big, huge skeleton to it to give it its shape and to give, help it to function. Excellent. So actually all the nuclei you actually see in this are actually nuclei from the connective tissue. Where is cardiac muscle found? Only in the walls of the heart. Only in the walls of the heart, excellent. Voluntary? It's involuntary. Involuntary, excellent. Striated? Yes. Yep, yes it is striated. We see the stripes very nicely. All the stripes of the muscle cells here lining up, perfect. Number of nuclei, one or many? One. Now, if you've read the textbook, you may have learned that there are a few cardiac muscle cells that might have two nuclei inside of them. It's not completely uncommon for that to occur. Why it occurs is not fully understood, but it doesn't happen a lot and it isn't something that can be consistently seen. So for the most part, it's one and we're gonna stick with one because it's just easier. But know that in reality, there may be some that have two, but it isn't significant or meaningful. And lastly, cardiac muscle, able to regenerate? No. No regeneration. Excellent, perfect. So we now know properties that all cardiac, I mean, all muscle tissues share. They're irritable, they can contract, they can be extended and they are elastic. We now have talked about the three types of uh, muscle tissue and talked about their differences and their shape and their function and their location. For most of the rest of this section, we are going to focus on skeletal muscle tissue. You are gonna learn everything you ever wanted to know and more. This is gonna be our primary focus moving forward. In fact, it won't be until that Monday before the exam that we will finally come back and talk more about smooth and cardiac. Once we've learned everything you ever wanted to know and more about skeletal muscle, we will briefly compare it to, to cardiac and smooth and talk about some of the similarities and some of the differences. So our focus moving forward for the vast majority of the rest of this section is going to focus solely on skeletal muscle tissue. All right. So that is the game plan. Questions on that? All right. Excellent. Then in that case, uh, it is time for our first break. Uh, caffeinate. During this first break, we are going to hit a massive amount of vocabulary, a massive amount of anatomy. So we are going dense, we are going deep. Our goal in this section is to take an organ like the bicep brachia and break it down, uh, not just from the organ, but down to the individual cell. And then inside of that cell, look at all the individual proteins. We are gonna break it all the way down to the individual proteins that make it up. Because once we understand the individual proteins that make it up, we can then see how it functions and build back up to understand how this muscle moves us through space. So our goal today is to get down to those bits and pieces. Once we understand all the bits and pieces, we can understand how this is gonna to work together in our body. All right, so again, it's gonna be a lot of work. It's gonna be a lot of vocabulary. So definitely caffeinate uh, during this first break. Uh, it is, looks like it's 9.15. So let's restart at 9.30. And I will start the recording at that time. All right, I'm going to go get my coffee. You do the same. See you in 15 minutes. There we go. So again, we're starting with organs that are the skeletal muscles. We have the skeletal muscle system, muscular system made up of skeletal muscle organs. And anyone know how many named skeletal muscle organs we have in the body? Right, start easy. Is it more than three? There you go. Augustine is yeah, absolutely. Not only is it over 500, but it's actually over 600. Over 600 named muscles in the body. 
Now, remember, you had 206 named bones and you had to learn all of them. Does that mean you have to learn all 600 named skeletal muscles? No, it's only like 512, so it's not too bad at all. So, All right, but that organ that is the skeletal muscle is made up of hundreds, if not thousands of skeletal muscle cells. Now, remember, we talked about how a skeletal muscle cell is basically a long cylinder shaped structure. And so because of that, they are often sometimes referred to as muscle fibers. And you will hear those two terms interchangeably. Muscle cell, muscle fiber basically means the exact same thing. Now, does that mean if I take a thousand skeletal muscle cells and throw them into a bucket, I suddenly have a muscle of the body? No, of course not. So they need to be organized, precisely organized, as we talked about, so that they can be efficient. So there are going to be many layers of connective tissues that organize these muscle cells in place, isolating them, coordinating them, allowing them to work together efficiently. Now, when organizing these muscles and, and these connective tissues, uh, fascias are a level of uh, muscle, uh, pardon me, a level of connective tissue, a dense irregular connective tissue that helps to define or distinguish individual muscles. And there are several types of fascias. Uh, the one that we're already familiar with is our hypodermis, or what we called our subcutaneous layer. Well, now because anatomists hate you, two names isn't enough, we'll give it a third. The name of the hypodermis, the name of the subcutaneous layer of the skin or under the skin is also known as the superficial fascia. And if you remember, when we talked about that areolar and adipose connective tissue that was under our skin, remember we have talked about how it allowed the skin to move freely over the top, well not freely, but uh, to give it some range of motion over the muscles. Because as we talked about, as you contract the muscles, they change shape underneath the skin. Remember we talked about how muscle comes from the Greek word moose, which means mice, because it looks like little mice running around underneath your skin. And so it allows uh, for that uh, movement of the muscles without putting too much strain and stress on our skin. So we actually talked about one type of fascia already. But another type of fascia is what is known as a deep fascia. A deep fascia basically stabilizes uh, muscles that have a similar function together. So for instance, all of the muscles that flex my elbow and all of the muscles that extend my elbow have their own fascias, their own connective tissues around them that uh, support them and protect them and hold them together. Now, again, you may not have thought of these things in these terms, but I know you are aware of these things. Because if you want, if we have time at the end, we can get into the deep philosophical discussion about whether or not meat is murder, right? So for those of you who are plant-based, uh, again, right, you may feel strongly about these things, but the one thing that we cannot deny is that meat is muscle. And so if you think about back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when there was no such thing as COVID, we could go to very important vital places in the world, like say a Renaissance fair. And of course, why would you go to a Renaissance fair? What is the number one reason to go to a Renaissance fair? The turkey leg. Exactly, the big, huge turkey leg, exactly, right? It is the size of a big, huge dinner plate. And when you're eating that, uh, does the meat just peel off as one continuous sheet? No. No, what actually happens is during that cooking process, the connective tissue of it is broken down. And so as you're tearing into that turkey leg, individual muscles come out of it. So you don't just get one peel of meat, you can actually see the individual muscles that have been held together by connective tissue. So as you're eating that and tearing the meat off, the, the muscles separate from each other because the cooking has broken down that deep fascia. So that deep fascia, which was holding those muscles together in the leg, it's not as easy before you cook that leg to pull off the individual muscles. You could get in there with a knife if you really wanted to and cut the deep fascia and separate the muscles that way. But it's much more efficient to just cook it 
and then it peels apart, right? It's much easier to debone a chicken after you cook it than it is before you cook it because you've broken down the connective tissue. Here we see an example of a muscle. And I keep using the example of the bicep brachia. This, of course, could not be the bicep brachia. Why could this not be the bicep brachia? Because the femur. Yeah, because it's connected to the femur, absolutely. So this clearly is a leg muscle of some type. But we again see that this muscle is made up of a bunch of muscle cells. So this is a muscle cell, and this is a muscle cell, and this is a muscle cell, and in fact, this is a muscle cell. But as we can see, these muscle cells are organized by connective tissues. So let's do this here first in the picture, and then we'll do it on uh, an illustration, and then we'll go back through it again one last time. Notice that the entire muscle itself is bounded by a connective tissue that wraps around and stabilizes the entire structure in place. It goes around the entire muscle. So not surprisingly, its name based on its location, wow, that's huge. That's a big difference. Based on its location, its name is an epimysium. This tissue type is a dense, irregular connective tissue. And this dense, irregular connective tissue basically holds the entire muscle together. It defines the muscle. So we have this epimysium. However, this epimysium is made up of bundles of muscle cells. Notice here, we have a bundle of muscle cells. This bundle of muscle cells is defined by a connective tissue. This connective tissue, once again, is a dense irregular connective tissue. And since I wrote it out once, I'll just abbreviate it here. And this one, defining this bundle based on its location, we call it a perimesium. Mesium, of course, refers to muscle. Peri means that it goes around the perimeter of this bundle. And of course, we have to have a fancy name for this bundle. And the fancy name for the bundle is a fascicle. So these bundles are fascicles. And notice okay, so the, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, so go ahead. The outside of it, or the yes. I guess, sense regular yeah. connective tissue itself is the perimesium, but then the whole thing itself is the exactly. classical. Okay. Exactly. You have a cake, which is a cake in its entire structure, but on the outside of the cake is frosting. So the frosting basically defines the perimeter of the cake, right? And that's what we have here. The perimesium defines the fascicle. Okay. And notice inside of this particular fascicle, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, and probably a couple more uh, muscle cells in here. So it is a bundle of muscle cells. However, as we look at this bundle of muscle cells, we see that there is connective tissue that insulates and isolates each one of them. Remember, one of the things we said about muscle cells is that they're irritable. They're electrically excitable. They can produce and spread an electrical signal. Kind of like the wires in your wall can produce, and well, they don't produce, but they spread an electrical signal. Now, if you were to open up your wall, would you see a bunch of just bare naked copper wires just intertwined with each other inside of your wall? No. No, I hope not, because then the signal would cross. You'd turn on your light switch and the garbage disposal would go on downstairs and your garage door would open, right? And all these other things would happen. We want to insulate them. We want to isolate them. And the same thing is true for these muscle cells. So around these individual muscle cells, we have 
an areolar connective tissue. that wraps around them, that based on its location inside of the fascicle, we call it an endomysium. Let's think of this a different way. Let's go to the whiteboard for this. We have individual muscle cells. And individual muscle cells have a connective tissue that wraps around them, insulating them and isolating them. What type of tissue wraps around each individual muscle cell? Endomysium. But what kind of tissue type? Is it? Areolar. Areolar. Exactly. So the tissue type is the areolar connective tissue. The tissue based on its location, you guys are correct, it's an endomysium. Now, this muscle cell insulated and isolated and 14 of its closest buddies are gonna be, uh, let's make it bigger, bound together into a bundle. And what are we going to call the bundle? Fascicle. All right. Excellent. So it is a fascicle. What type of tissue binds these together? Perimetheum. Well, again, that's the Tensor tissue based on connective its location. Tissue. But the tissue type is a, and again, I'm running out of space here, so I'm going to abbreviate it, dense regular connective tissue. Excellent. A muscle will be made up of multiple fascicles. And these fascicles plus blood vessels and nerves are going to be bundled together to form a muscle. So now again, our structure is the actual muscle, the organ. Oops, that did not write at all. all right. What type of tissue forms this bundle? Dense regular connective tissue. Another dense regular connective tissue, just like the purple one we drew, but this one binding the fascicles and the blood vessels and nerves together based on its location, we call it epimysium. Epimysium. Excellent. 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 And here's one more fun, interesting fact. These connective tissues run the entire length of the muscle cells and expand beyond the muscle cells. So the collagen fibers from the epimysium expand beyond the muscle cells. The collagen fibers of the perimysium expand beyond the muscle cells. And even the collagen fibers of the areolar connective tissue expand beyond the muscle cells. Notice as all these collagen fibers expand beyond the muscle cells, all the collagen fibers kind of become parallel to each other. What have I just formed here at the end of my muscle? Muscle fibers? Well, they're not muscle fibers. Tendon. Exactly. They come together to form a dense regular connective tissue. And this dense regular connective tissue is going to attach the muscle to the bone, which 
makes it a tendon. Oops. So the tendon is actually formed by all of these connective tissues extending out beyond the muscle cell. All right, we've done it here. Let's do it a couple more times. Notice here, again, we have an organ that is the muscle. And that organ that is the muscle has a dense irregular connective tissue that bundles together all of the fascicles. Notice these fascicles are bundles of muscle cells. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 fascicles plus the blood vessels and the nerves are all bundled together into our muscle by that dense irregular connective tissue that based on its location, we call an epimysin. Notice we can pull out one of the fascicles and look at that. This fascicle, as we know, is a bundle of muscle cells usually tens to hundreds. Obviously this is just an illustration. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight muscle cells inside of this fascicle. This fascicle, this bundle is formed by a dense irregular connective tissue that based on its location, we call a perimesium. But notice we can also pull one of these muscle cells out for a closer look. And as we pull this muscle cell out for a closer look, there are two things that we see about it. The first is that it has a connective tissue that wraps around it. That connective tissue that wraps around it is an areolar connective tissue that by forming that insulation, of the muscle cell we call an endomesium. But the last thing we notice is that notice there's a whole lot of stuff going on inside the muscle cell. So even though we are down to the level of that single cylinder shaped muscle cell, we have a lot more anatomy to look at. Now, there are a couple obvious things that should stand out for us. What do you think these two things pushed way to the side might be? Nucleus. Nucleus, if you weren't sure, you could have cheated because it said it right there, excellent. It's blocked off so you don't see it here, but what do you think these things in here are? Mitochondria. Mitochondria, what do mitochondria do again? Like make energy. Energy, absolutely, make ATP. And remember, this is gonna be actively contracting needs a massive amount of ATP. So not surprisingly, it has a massive amount of mitochondria in it. And then there are all these red dots. All these red dots represent a specialized organelle that we'll talk about in just a minute. So clearly there's a whole lot more going on inside of this muscle cell. And that's what we're gonna break down next. But one last picture to make sure we understand this. Actually, I lied, two. This illustration that shows the breakdown is we can see clearly in an illustration, but is this something we could see under the microscope? Absolutely. Notice here we see an individual muscle cell. And notice there's a whole lot of stuff going on inside of it. But what we can also clearly see is that here's a second muscle cell. And there is, I'll change colors here a little bit of white space in between them. What do you think that white space in between the muscle cells might be based on its location? Endomesium. Endomesium. And what type of tissue would it be? Areolar. Areolar. Notice all of these muscle cells are bundled together by a connective tissue. What type of connective tissue would this be? The dense irregular connective tissue. Dense irregular. What would we call that based on its location? Perimesium. 
And what is the structure that is formed here? Fascicles. Yeah, fascicle, excellent. Notice this fascicle and this one over here and this one over here, plus this blood vessel that we see here, this blood vessel that we see here. Notice all of these things are bound together by one more connective tissue to form the muscle. What type of connective tissue would this be? Dense irregular. Dense irregular, and what would we call it based on its location? The mesium. The mesium. Epimesium, excellent. So notice all these things we've talked about on the illustrations we can clearly see under a light microscope as well. Yes, Aubrey, you had a question? Yeah, so the epimesium is, is thick in comparison. Uh, yes, because it, it's basically the walls that defines the entire muscle. This one, it's cut in such a way where it's dramatically different, but I think it's more because it was cut at an oblique angle. It isn't necessarily gonna always be this much thicker when we see it, but uh, but it is going to be, it, it'll definitely be, it's definitely going to be thicker than the uh, than the endomesium uh, and, and likely bigger than the peri as well. All right, thank you. Yep. And lastly, one more simple illustration. Again, I like this one to end with because again, we see here a single muscle cell that has that areolar connective tissue wrapped around it that endomesium. We see that muscle cell and 12 of its closest friends are bundled together into a fascicle by that perimesium. And then notice seven fascicles plus blood vessels and nerves are bundled together into a muscle, the organ, by the epimesium. But like I said, what I like most about this is it reminds us how all of their connective tissues are going to extend beyond the muscle cells. And as they extend beyond the muscle cells, they become parallel. They form that dense regular connective tissue that is going to form our tendon and going to attach it to the muscle. All right. Questions on that? All right, so we started with a muscle like the bicep brachia. Oh, I think we talked about this as a vocabulary term we've done before. Remember, what was the difference between a tendon and a ligament? A tendon attaches muscle to bone and a ligament attaches muscle to muscle. Close, uh, you are correct. <laughs> a tendon connects muscle to bone, but a ligament connects what? What do ligaments connect? Not what? muscle to muscle, but I thought bone to bone. Bone to oh, bone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no worries. I, I, I knew what you meant. Uh, absolutely. So tendons connect muscle to bone, ligaments connect bone to bone. However, in some places, and if you've started looking at this material, uh, for instance, you see a big white surface on the top of the head or a big white surface over the belly region of our body. Those are big, broad, flat tendons. And as we know, anatomists love to name everything. So they've given a fancy name to a big, broad, flat tendon. And that name is an aponeurosis. IS is, is the singular, aponeurosis, ES is the plural. And we will be responsible for identifying some aponeuroses. So I just, while we're talking about tendons, I wanted to mention that here. All right. So this is what we have done so far. This is our organ, the skeletal muscle, with that epimesium around all of the individual bundles of muscle cells, the fascicles and all of that. We pulled out a fascicle, and then we pulled out a muscle cell that we can see has its areolar connective tissue, that epimesium inside of them. However, as we also saw, there were all these red dots inside of the muscle cell. And we can pull out one of those red dots. And as we pull out one of those red dots, we see it is a specialized contractile organelle. And this specialized contractile organelle is called a myofibril. 
And this is going to be what's responsible for generating the tension, generating the force that moves the body through space. And this myofibril is going to be kind of like a train, right? A train is a continuous thing, but really it's made up of a bunch of cars. And especially like a grain train, right? Is you know, you may be sitting there at a at a railroad crossing waiting for half an hour while 500 of the identical grain cars go by. So it is a repetitive pattern. Well, here we have a repetitive pattern of proteins known as a sarcomere. So a myofibril is basically made up of a bunch of sarcomeres end to end to end to end that is made up of a bunch of proteins. So we need to get down here to this protein level to really understand how a muscle cell works. All right, to do this, we need to talk about how you make a muscle cell. Because remember, one of the unique characteristics about the muscle cell is that it has multiple nuclei. And the reason for this is a skeletal muscle cell is actually made up of not one, but hundreds of embryonic cells that fuse together. These special embryonic cells are known as mesodermal cells. If you think back, remember we learned about how our mesenchymal cells make connective tissues? Right, so if you need to make chondroblasts or osteoblasts or adipocytes or anything like that, we used our mesenchymal cells to do that. They're a pluripotent stem cell. Well, mesendermal cells are a special stem cell that produces our immature cells, our myoblasts, and hundreds of these myoblasts fuse together to make a single skeletal muscle cell. That should hopefully explain two things for us. One is we now understand why it has multiple nuclei, because if hundreds of cells are coming together to make it, it's gonna have hundreds of nuclei inside of them. But it also helps us to understand the regeneration. Normally we know that when a cell is damaged or a tissue is damaged, other cells will divide to make new cells to fill up that space, like we saw in the skin. Well, can a skeletal muscle cell divide to produce two mus skeletal muscle cells and then grow no. and get bigger? No, it's not going to be able to work that way. So it can't just divide the skeletal muscle cells to make more. However, remember, we do have some limited ability to regenerate. And the reason for that is it turns out not all of the myoblasts fuse together to form the muscle cell. Notice here in this simple illustration, four of the five fuse together to form our single muscle cell, but one of these myoblasts stays separate. And the same thing happens with the mature cells. In the mature cells, there are these myoblasts that don't fuse to the muscle cell. They stay separate from them. We give them a fancy name. We call them satellite cells. And so if this cell is damaged or destroyed, this satellite cell is able to divide, make many new cells and replace that cell that was destroyed or repair that cell that was damaged. However, we have a limited number of satellite cells. So as I said, if that shark takes a big, huge chunk out of my arm, Am I gonna have enough satellite cells in that area where I can replace all of the tissue that has been lost? No. No. And so the limited number of satellite cells is why we have a limited regeneration. So with a limited number of satellite cells giving us a limited regeneration. Now, if you were a smart, sophisticated student, like I know you guys are, and I'm sure you've already started looking at some of the resources we have on our website. If you haven't, then of course, first and foremost, shame on you. But secondly, uh, do, 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 do.
this stupid dual uh, I didn't set this up ahead of time. Sorry. <laughs> so it's just not us employees. You guys have to do this whole new duo dual uh, authorization thing. Yes. Yeah. At least you can set it so that it reminds you every 30 days so you don't have to do it forever. All right, excellent. Well, the good news is this was stuff we needed to get to anyway, so I guess it doesn't hurt that we're doing this now. Under section four, so let's actually do this together now. In your section four, under your lab handouts, one of the things that you should see here is the muscle classroom models. As you click on the muscle classroom models, you get the warning saying, hey, this doesn't work, try it again. And so then you're gonna try it again. And when you click on the muscle classroom models, You are gonna see muscle tissues. What muscle tissue do you think this represents? Skeletal. Skeletal. What muscle tissue do you think this represents? Cardiac. Well, look at the shape. Uh, smooth. 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 This, notice, because it has the striations, is our mm -hmm. skeletal, I mean, is our cardiac. We'll talk about that. Notice also, if I were to show you one of these pictures, not only should you recognize this tissue, but you should know its characteristics. So for instance, on the exam, if I showed you this picture and asked you to identify two characteristics of this tissue, what could you say? Striated. Striated. What else? Uninucleated. Uninucleated. Branch shape. Excellent. What else? Tell me something you don't know about it just by looking at it. Again, nothing wrong with those things. All of those things were 100% absolutely correct and really fine. But tell me something you know about it that you can't tell just by looking at it. Ah, involuntary. What else? Passive. Say again. Wait, never mind. Okay. There's well, no regeneration. No regeneration. You guys haven't even done the easy one. Where do you find it? Makes only, oh, the heart. Yeah, only oh, found only in the heart. Absolutely. Excellent. So we have all of those. Those are questions that I could ask. The other nice thing that they have in the classroom are these skeletal muscle models. This is the one I want to show you in particular for right now. This is a single muscle cell with all of the hunk and junk inside of it. And so far, I want to show you two of the things that we have talked about so far. Notice if you look closely here, this pink is the plasma membrane of the cell, right? Be comfortable with that? Single cell, that is its plasma membrane on the outer surface. Notice there is this tissue that is surrounding it. Any idea what type of tissue that might be? That's irregular. Well, remember, we're around a single muscle cell right now. So Real. it would be the areolar connective tissue. And what would we call it based on its location? Endomesium. Endomesium, absolutely, excellent. Notice if you look closely outside of the muscle cell, so it is not a muscle cell, it's not part of the muscle cell, but it is inside the endomesium, is this big beige blob. Any idea what that big beige blob may represent? I know it's been a while because of that whole uh, thing, but what were we just talking about? A satellite cell. Satellite cell, exactly. Yeah. That is our satellite cell. 
That is an example of one of the satellite cells. They've done a nice job of putting that on there to remind you it's right there next to the muscle cell to help it to repair if needed, but it's not a part of the muscle cell, but it is nestled in the, epi, uh, the endomysium. So absolutely. So these satellite cells are what allow the muscles to uh, repair, that limited repair that they have. Now, again, we've just started this section and I know it's already a fair amount of vocabulary and I promise you it's just gonna get worse. And it's already been an exhausting semester to begin with. So one of the things we could certainly decide to do is just chuck this whole A and P thing. And instead, when we meet for four and a half hours each day, we could work out together for four and a half hours each day and do that for the rest of the semester. Sounds good. It sounds awesome, absolutely. And if we did that at the end of the semester, what would happen to all of our muscles? Yeah, all of our muscles would be bigger. Do you think our muscles get bigger, though, because we add more muscle cells to it? No. No. Notice we don't have an easy way to make new muscle cells. So instead, what would happen is the reason we would get stronger, and more importantly, the reason our muscles would get bigger is because we would add more proteins. inside the muscle cell. Wow, that is huge. We would be adding more proteins inside the muscle cell. And so our muscles get bigger because they grow wider. This type of increase in size is what we call hypertrophy. So typically our muscles get bigger, not by adding more muscle cells, but by adding more proteins, hypertrophy. Of course, at the end of the semester, when we all take the final, we're all gonna fail the final because we haven't been studying it, which means next semester we have to take the class over again. And so we're gonna be locked in a closet studying this material and not having the opportunity to work out. And when you're not using those muscles anymore, what happens to those muscles? The atrophy. Yeah, exactly. They shrink in size, and you are absolutely correct. The term for that is atrophy. So those muscles would get smaller in size because as we're not using them, as we said, it's a very dynamic tissue. So without that use, uh, we break down those proteins. And as we break down those proteins, the muscles get smaller. You see this all the time with bodybuilders or professional athletes or wrestlers, right? Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, in his Conan days versus Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, he was okay. half of the man he was when he was working out regularly and was huge and massive and big and bulky, right? So again, we have this dynamics of the increase and decrease in size of the muscles but it's not by adding new cells. Instead, it is by adding or subtracting proteins. All right. So again, I have a question. Yes. So if you were to allow like a muscle, say for like three years, you just let it atrophy. Would it be possible for you to bring that muscle back? So here's the problem with that. And this is one of the problems that, that happens to people who are, have you know, chronic back injuries or things like that that keep, keep them, or people who are in a comas. This is another issue for people who are in comas for a long period of time. Uh, one of the things that the nurses will do is they will come in and move the portions of their body. Because yes, one of the issues that you're gonna have is if those muscles are not being used, they will start to atrophy. The other problem that's gonna happen is as that muscle atrophies, uh, it is gonna to start to be replaced by uh, fibrous connective tissues. And obviously those fibrous connective tissues are not gonna move, are not gonna be able to contract, are not gonna be able to do the things that your other muscles do. So your joints will get tighter, you'll have a limited range of motion. So uh, there can be problems with that where basically you're gonna lose the, the flexibility and the strength and the 
uh, elasticity of those muscles from that. So that can be a problem. So it's one of the big issues with com coma patients. People are constantly coming in and moving their bodies for them during that time. And it's also one of the major issues they're trying to overcome with prolonged space flights. You know, as we're trying to get to Mars uh, and there's no gravity, we have to figure out how we're going to be able to maintain uh, muscle mass and flexibility for those individuals on those long flights. So, uh, so yes, that, that can be an issue. It's not just going to be able to come back uh, because you have that, the, you'll have a buildup of connective tissue, which will restrict motion and range of motion and, and, and strength. Okay. Yep. All righty. Now, um, hold on. So again, primary growth is via hypertrophy, not the adding of new cells. Now, in an extreme situation like, where is it? There it is. Like our friend here, do you get this kind of muscle mass by just adding proteins to the muscle? No. Steroids. Well, okay. <laughs> Steroids is something else we'll talk about entirely, but no, this kind of muscle mass can be produced without the use of steroids. But in this type of extreme exertion that he is putting on the body, in this case, this extreme exertion can stimulate those satellite cells to divide and make new cells. So in extreme conditions, uh, some new cell formation can occur. And for these individuals who are gaining mass by adding muscles, uh, that process is called hyperplasia. But like I said, it takes that type of extreme situation to stimulate that hyperplasia. Mere mortals like you and I uh, typically just increase our muscle mass by hypertrophy. All right. Questions on that? Um, so for the mesodermal cells and the myoblasts, are they the same thing or interchangeable or not? No, no. Mesodermal cell is a pluripotent stem cell. That becomes myoblasts, which are a unipotent stem cell. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, clarification. Thank you for asking for that so that I can make that clarification. Absolutely. So yeah, mesodermal cells can actually become other things as well. Uh, but once they become uni, uh, myoblasts, they're unipotent at that point and they can only produce skeletal muscle cells. All right, now we know how to make a skeletal muscle cell. We need to talk about the anatomy of a skeletal muscle cell. And not surprisingly, there's gonna be a lot of specialization to this and therefore a lot of special vocabulary. Now, we know these are, let's just cheat and do this. Long cylinder shaped cells. So we'll look at an end of one of the cylinders here. Let's draw it like that and then cheat and do that. Here we go. Of course, we know this is a cell. And so, of course, like all cells, it is going to have a plasma membrane. However, skeletal muscle has a specialized plasma membrane. Remember, we said these things were electrically excitable. Now, again, I have to work on my uh, examples because normally I'm in the classroom. And normally at this point in the classroom, I pick up my yardstick there's this nice big wooden yardstick that has my name on it and that has those nice metal ends in it. And I grab it and I shove that metal end into the light socket and smoke pours out and there's a large explosion and there's electricity all over the place as a result of that. And do I have to worry about any of that while I'm holding the other end of that wooden yardstick? No. No, why not? The wood grounds it out. 
yeah, the wood doesn't conduct the electricity. If it was a metal yardstick, mm. would I have to worry then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And that's the key to our plasma membrane. Our plasma membrane of our muscle cell is specialized where it is able to produce and propagate is the fancy word. But uh, let's put propagate oops, in parentheses. Because it is able to produce and spread an action potential. So it has a specialized plasma membrane. And so not surprisingly, we give it a specialized name. We call it a sarcoplasm. So the sarcoplasm is the plasma membrane of our muscle cell. And we give it a special name because it's specialized. It's specialized to produce and spread an action potential. Of course, we know the cytoplasm is the stuff inside the cell. And in our muscle cell, it has some special stuff in here as well. And so again, we're gonna give it a special name. We'll call it the sarcoplasm. Sarco means flesh. So this is all related to our muscle, right? Meat is muscle. Oh, sorry, I did that wrong. Uh, so this is the sarcoplasm. Our plasma membrane is our sarcolemma. I apologize for that. Sometimes when I get talking, I'm not paying attention to what I'm saying. There we go, excellent. So our plasma membrane is the sarcolemma. The sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm inside. Now, again, we expect to have all of the, much of the normal stuff we expect a cell to have, uh, nucleus, and we know we have multiple nuclei, uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, all those normal things. But remember, we also talked about cells can have special inclusions in their cytoplasm. These are things that are uh, unique characteristics to it, or maybe just a few couple of cells uh, that allow it to do its specific function. And in the case of our muscle cell, uh, there are three big inclusions, uh, three big specializations that there is a lot of. For starters, we have lots of mitochondria. Remind me again what those mitochondria do? Energy. Someone remind me again how they make ATP? Glycolysis? Glycolysis is part of it. You've got the right idea. We take glucose and we break it down. However, to break it down completely, what do we need to do? What do we need to fully and completely break down that glucose? Um, is, it a, is it like a oxygen? Say again? Oxygen. Oxygen, exactly. Oxygen, right? It, and again, this occurs in the mitochondria. In the mitochondria, we completely break down that glucose with oxygen. That gives us a ton of energy. And remember, we talked about as a result of this, you also get uh, water and carbon dioxide as waste products. Remember, we called this process cellular respiration because it uses oxygen and gives off CO2. So not surprisingly, we have a lot of mitochondria because we need lots of energy to contract. But notice, to make lots of energy, we need sugar and oxygen. So not surprisingly, inside of our muscle cell, there is lots of glycogen. What is glycogen again? Sugar. Yeah, it's stored glucose. So we have a massive amount of stored glucose here inside of our muscle cell. And we also have lots of this specialized protein. And that specialized protein is called myoglobin. Myo can means muscle, but myoglobin sounds an awful lot like what? 
Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. And someone remind me what hemoglobin does again? Where do you find hemoglobin? In the blood. Yeah, where red. specifically in the blood? Red blood cells. In the red blood cells, yeah. right? And what do the red blood cells do with all that hemoglobin? Carry oxygen. Carry oxygen, exactly. So these myoglobin proteins inside of our muscle cell are able to store lots of oxygen. So notice inside of our muscle cell, we have a lot of oxygen, we have a lot of sugar, and we have a lot of mitochondria, all of which are gonna to work together to help us to make massive amounts of ATP so that we can contract this muscle and move our body through space. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's talk about some other things that are going on. One of the interesting things about our sarcolemma is not only does the sarcolemma cover the surface of the cell, but it actually has these big folds in the sarcolemma that penetrate deep down into the muscle cell. These big folds in the plasma membrane that go deep into the muscle cell are called the transverse tubules. Once you've written them out once in a essay question or something like that, you can then abbreviate them T-tubules to make sure you spell them out the first time. These are folds of the plasma membrane that go inside. So in this space, is there stuff inside from inside the cell in this space or is this the fluid from outside the cell? It's from outside the cell? Yeah, so this actually contains uh, the interstitial fluid. Right, this is important because if we think about it and let's erase this right? Where is there going to be more potassium? Is there going to be more potassium inside the cell or in the transverse tubule? Transverse tubule. Well, where is there? So let's think out here. Outside the cell, is there more uh, potassium outside the cell or inside the cell? Inside. Yeah, remember there's more potassium inside. Where is there more sodium, outside the cell or inside the cell? Outside. Outside the cell. And so we're gonna say the same thing in the transverse tubule. There's gonna be more sodium in the fluid in the transverse tubule, whereas inside the cell, there's gonna be more potassium. So this transverse tubule contains the interstitial fluid. I know that doesn't seem important, but the reason this is important is because remember, as we mentioned, this sarcolemma can produce and spread an action potential across the plasma membrane. And by having interstitial fluid down here, it can spread that action potential down the transverse tubule as well. So we can take that action potential and not just spread it across the top of the cell, but we can actually take it into the cell as well. All righty. It has a Golgi apparatus. It has mitochondria, a ton of mitochondria. It has rough endoplasmic reticulum. And another thing that it has is it has our smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Someone remind me again what our smooth endoplasmic reticulum does? Um, it stores for calcium. Protein. Um, yeah, it can, proteins. again, it can be used to make lipids. Uh, it can do a little bit of detoxifying, but remember we talked about how in some cells it can be specialized for storage. And that's exactly what happens here. Here in our skeletal muscle cell, we have a specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum that is specialized for the storage of calcium. In fact, outside of the matrix of our bones, here inside of our muscle cells in this smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the largest uh, concentration of calcium 
outside of our bones. So basically it forms, uh, let's do this in orange, this kind of mesh, thin mesh-like structure that contains all this calcium inside of it. But what's interesting is when it gets near the end of the, oops, when it gets towards the transverse tubule, the sarcoplasmic, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum enlarges. So notice the same thing would happen over here as well. We would get this enlargement of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum where it gets near the transverse tubules. Now, of course, we're going to have to give a fancy name to this uh, specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it is indeed called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it stores calcium, but doesn't it can it also release it? Yeah, it stores and releases. Okay. Absolutely. It doesn't just lock it in there forever. Okay. It's going to release it as well. Absolutely. Okay. And these enlarged ends are known as the terminal cisterna being singular, cisterna being plural. So the enlarged ends of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the terminal cisternae. And notice one more thing as well. We have a transverse tubule and two terminal cisternae. We have three things together. And these three things together are collectively known as the triad. So you said it was the, the re sarcoplasmic reticulum, the terminal cisternae, and what else that made it the triad? Two. Notice oh, the terminal yeah. cisternae on one side, the terminal cisternae on the other side, and then the transverse tubule in between. So oh. those are the three things. So two terminal cisternae and one transverse tubule, three things. Isn't the terminal cisternae part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Yeah. This is at the end. Just at the so, end, exactly. Okay. Yep. Yeah, right. My two fingernails and my nose, right? So my two fingernails and my nose would be a three things together. My fingernail is part of my finger, but it's also collectively, functionally part of these three things together. That would be the triad. So that's what we have here. Now notice, it looks like this is just traveling straight through. And again, part of that is my limited artistic skills. But the other thing that is going on here is we have, remember, those big, large, specialized organelles that run the entire length of the cell. And these specialized organelles are what we call the myofibrils. Myofibrils, as we mentioned, are made up of a massive number of proteins. And just for clarification, it is important to note that the T tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum wrap around them. We'll look at the illustration from the textbook and we'll look at the model again in just a minute and see these examples. These myofibrils run the entire length of the muscle cell. And these myofibrils are the contractile organelle. They're what generate the force. They're what change the shape of the cell. And I know my illustration doesn't do a good job of showing this, but the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the transverse tubules wrap around them. Now, as I mentioned, this is made of proteins that are perfectly aligned. And they're perfectly aligned 
in a repetitive pattern. So basically what we have here is a series of proteins that are perfectly arranged into, like we said, those boxcars of our train. And this repetitive pattern of proteins is known as a sarcomere. This sarcomere is basically the functional and structural unit, meaning it is what is actually interacting and generating the force causing the movement, but it is also the perfect alignment of them that give our muscle cell its stripes. Now, I appreciate that again, my drawing skills are not the greatest. So let's use the pretty drawing of your textbook. So notice here we have our muscle cell. We have our sarcolemma that wraps around the entire surface. We see the nuclei pushed up against the sides of the walls of our sarcolemma. We see some mitochondria hanging out inside. And notice we see all of these big, long contractile organelles. All these proteins perfectly aligned or would shove the nuclei to the side. And notice we can pull it out where we have this repetitive pattern of proteins that we call a sarcomere. Let's take a closer look. Here we see a nice illustration. Notice we can see a couple of nice things here. For starters, we have our sarcolemma on the outer surface. And notice here, we get a nice view of how there are folds in the sarcolemma, those transverse tubules that penetrate deep into the muscle cell. But notice they also have to wrap around those myofibrils. So here we have those contractile organelles. Here we see a bunch of cut ends of those myofibrils. And we see how the transverse tubules have to wrap around them all. Notice also that the transverse tubule isn't the only thing that wraps around the myofibril. Our sarcoplasmic reticulum, storing and releasing that calcium, wraps around the myofibrils as well. And notice when the sarcoplasmic reticulum comes close to the transverse tubule, it enlarges into that big terminal cisternae. And collectively, the two terminal cisternae and the transverse tubule form a triad. So we have that sarcolemma. We have the inside, the sarcoplasm. Again, we have those inclusions, the glycogen granules for stored glucose, myoglobin to store oxygen, and mitochondria to use that oxygen to completely break down the glycogen to make ATP. We have the transverse tubules here in yellow penetrating deep down into the muscle cell, those folds in of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, they're gonna contain interstitial fluid inside of them. We have our specialized smooth endoplasmic reticulum with this kind of woven mesh that wraps around the myofibril. However, as we talked about, it's gonna store and release calcium. And at the ends, it enlarges 
to form these large transverse, uh, pardon me, uh, terminal cisternae and terminal cisternae along with the transverse tubule form the triad. So here we have a triad in its entirety. And the most common organelle that we see in here are these big, huge myofibrils. Long thread-like organelles that run the entire length of the muscle cell made of a massive number of proteins. And since these are proteins found inside of a muscle cell, we call them myofilaments. There are dozens of myofilaments uh, working together inside of this muscle cell to help it function. You're gonna be responsible for knowing specifically seven of them. So of the dozens and dozens that are in there, you only need to know seven types. That's not too, too bad. And these proteins are arranged in a precise repeating pattern known as a sarcomere. And we'll talk about the anatomy of the sarcomere in much more depth in a moment. But notice there's this zigzagged protein here and another zigzagged protein there. Those boundaries, one zigzag protein to the next, that is one sarcomere. So notice here's that dividing point. So there was a sarcomere here and then the next one there, and then there'll be the next one, and then there'll be the next one, and so on and so on, down the entire length of the myofibril. All right. Questions on this? This doesn't make sense. You need to let me know now because it's just going to get worse. All right. As I mentioned, here we see one zigzagged line of proteins, another zigzagged line of proteins. And again, the structure in between is a sarcomere. This is a nice illustration that shows this point, but what we see right here is actually a light, uh, pardon me, an electron microscopy. Using an electron microscope, we're actually able to see these individual proteins inside of a single muscle cell. So we can actually see, if you look closely, what we can see here is that this is one myofibril right here that we're seeing a portion of. Notice there's this kind of bubbly stuff above it. That would be the transverse tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticulum that wrap around it. And then you can actually notice where the next myofibril starts. And notice the dark dense proteins here line up, the lighter region lines up, the dark line lines up. Again, there's tremendous precision inside these, not just within the individual myofibrils, but all of the myofibrils of the muscle cell. And as we saw, they even line up with the myofibrils in the next muscle cell as well. And again, this perfectly aligned uh, uh, protein structure is known as a sarcomere. This sarcomere is made up of three different types of proteins. Like I said, there are dozens, plural, that make up a sarcomere. But as I mentioned, you're gonna be responsible for seven of those, so that's not too bad. But all of these dozens of proteins are basically going to fall into one of three types. Those three types are either going to be structural. And what do you think structural proteins do? They organize the proteins? Yeah, they make the structure. Contractile, what do you think they do? Contract. Produce the contraction, produce right. the tension. And is our muscle cell contracting all of the time? No. No, so we need a way to turn it on and off. So our third type are gonna be regulatory proteins. And guess what regulatory proteins do? 
Turn the contraction on and off. Turn the contraction on and off. Absolutely. So when we come back from our break, we will talk about the different proteins, the three main types, identify the seven you're responsible for, and we will see how they are arranged into a sarcomere. All right, more fun vocabulary, more fun dense anatomy. So let's take one more break. It is uh, 1043, so let's come back at 1058. Take a quick 15 minute break, get more caffeine, and I will restart the recording and we'll finish things off when we get back. Any questions? All right, see you in 15 minutes. Any questions before we dive back into the material? Hopefully you recaffeinated again. All right. Excellent. So as I mentioned, there are three main types of myofilaments that we need to be responsible for. As we said, they're the contractile proteins. These are the ones that generate the force of the contraction. And as we will learn, there are two of these that we need to know. There are regulatory proteins, either ones that turn the contraction on and off. And as it turns out, there are two of these that we need to know. The remaining are structural proteins. And in fact, the vast majority, like I said, dozens of structural proteins are necessary for the precision of the pro uh, proteins within a single myofibril, between the myofibrils, even between muscle cells. But like I said, we're gonna simplify things a little bit and you're only gonna be responsible for three structural proteins that help to give the sarcomere its shape and its function. So let's talk about these and let's go to the whiteboard to do this first. Uh, let's talk first about our contractile proteins. There are two contractile proteins and let's actually get the other ones on here too. As I mentioned, there are two contractile proteins that you need to know. And those two contractile proteins are myosin and actin. Now, myosin is by far the largest of all of the proteins found in the myofibril. And so it is often sometimes referred to as the thick filament whereas pretty much all the rest of these are known as thin filaments. Myosin, like actin, as we'll see in a minute, is a dimer. What does dimer mean? Let me go ahead and erase actin for right now. Come back to it later. Anyone know what a dimer means? It's all right, I don't know either, so we'll just move on. Now, what a dimer means is that it is made up of two subunits. Basically, what a myosin is, is it is a protein that has a large head region, and then it has a long tail region. So again, it has two distinct parts. It has a head and it has a tail. But as I mentioned, it is a dimer. So basically the way it's found is by, and I guess we'll slightly change the color to emphasize this. Two of these proteins intertwine their tails with each other, and then they have the two heads coming off of it. This is basically what a myosin protein looks like. And what we're able to do is to take this myosin protein and put a chunk of them together. Let's actually go to a new board to be able to do this. We are gonna have this big, huge, thick filament. And we'll do two of them. 
that then have all of these head units that we talked about coming off of them. Before I do this one, I think I need to move this down a little bit more. Oops, I didn't align this very well. Let's try to align this a little bit better. There we go. And we need to put the heads on those. So these are found in the center of our sarcomere. <clears throat> now, these heads are our motors. And since we just talked about this earlier today, I'm sure someone can remind me what a motor does again. It's chemical energy into mechanical energy. Exactly, it converts chemical energy into mechanical energy. In this case, of course, the chemical energy is going to be ATP. And the mechanical force that it produces is basically a pivot of the head, where the head basically pivots forward. So it performs this pivot, or what we call a power stroke. And that is, how you spell pivot? Uh, that is basically what he uses. He uses that ATP to basically pull, to jerk on something. Notice I'm grabbing and pulling right now. Am I going anywhere? No. No, why not? Why aren't no. I going anywhere? You're not grabbing onto anything. Right, there's nothing that I'm grabbing onto. To be able to perform that power stroke, to be able to move, I need to be able to pull on something. And that is where our second contractile protein comes in. Our second contractile protein, as I mentioned, is our actin. Actin is again, one of the thin filaments, but it is also a dimer made up of two subunits. However, this time, the subunits are basically little globular subunits, two little ball shapes. That's basically all an actin protein is. And I'm gonna cheat now and switch to the, uh, the line. So what I can easily do is take two of these and put them together, or three of these and put them together, or four of these and put them together. And suddenly I have a big long line of actins. And so basically I'm able to form this big, huge, thin line of actins. And on these actins, they have the handholds where our myosin heads can grab. So our myosin heads are gonna grab onto these handholds on the actin, what is called the, not surprisingly, myosin binding site. Right, we've got that myosin binding site, or it's also called the active site where our myosin can grab and pull. So notice if I had a rung of a ladder here, I wouldn't just be grabbing and pulling, I could be pulling myself up that ladder by grabbing and pulling. And that's what our myosin is gonna do. It is gonna grab and pull on that actin. Now for our drawing, I'll cheat a little bit, I'm just going to draw it as a line. I 
Let's pretend these were all the same size. Pretend those were all the same. But the myosin heads are going to be able to grab onto that actin. Remember that actin. We'll draw one so that we remember what it actually is. So there are these dimers here. And as we said, on these dimers are the binding sites where that myosin head can grab and pull. Does that make sense? So far, so good. Like I said, if this doesn't make sense, let me know now, because it's just going to get worse. Are we going to always refer to it as just myosin or myosin head? Or? Well, myosin is the entire protein, but it is the head that is what grabs and pulls. OK. OK. Thank you for that clarification. Excellent. So there we go. We have our two contractile proteins, right? That it, one is the one that is doing the force, grabbing and pulling, and then we need one that you're able to grab onto. And again, I have to work on my examples because we're not sitting in the classroom, but I like the examples I have, so it's hard. Um, how many of you have actually ever been on campus? <laughs> At least a couple of I you. Yeah. Okay, a couple of you have. Uh, one of the things as you leave campus, depending on how you leave campus, there happens to be a McDonald's uh, close by campus. And I don't know if any of you have gone through the drive through of the McDonald's before, but if you have, like me, you've noticed that right there next to the, uh, the, the box where you talk into to order your food is a big ladder built into the side of the building that you could use to get to the roof of the McDonald's. And every time that I'm there in line, I stare at that because I want to climb that ladder and get onto the roof of the McDonald's. But I've never done it. Has anybody else seen that ladder? Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Do you know why you can't climb that ladder to get to the roof? There's something covering it where you can't. Yeah, grab. there's basically a big plexiglass board over the top of it that doesn't allow you to be able to grab onto the rungs and climb to the roof. And that is exactly how our regulatory proteins work. There are two regulatory proteins. The first regulatory protein is known as tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is a long thread-like protein. And lays over the top of the actin. So basically, and let's cheat and go to our picture. Basically here, laying along the top of the actin is this long thread-like protein called tropomyosin. Like that plexiglass shield, it blocks the binding site on the actin. And when the binding site of the actin is blocked, can our myosin heads grab onto the actin? No. 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 And so basically here we have this, well, we haven't labeled anything on this. So let's go ahead and label these things. Uh, not big. Uh, that's our myosin. This is our actin. And then this is our tropomyosin. This long thread-like protein that sits over the top of the actin and blocks the binding site, which is awesome. Because we don't want our uh, myosin constantly pulling on our actin. We don't want to be in a constant state of contraction. That would not be fun. 
right? You think my lectures are hard now. Just imagine what it would be like if my mouth was in a constant state of contraction and I couldn't open it, right? It wouldn't be a whole heck of a lot of fun. So the, the ability to stop the muscles from contracting, relaxing the muscle is definitely a good thing. How, what else? Uh, Go ahead. Sorry. How does it know to like stop when to go or I guess, or when to So block. you hit it on the head, absolutely. However, there are times when we want to contract a muscle. And so when we want to contract a muscle, there must be a way to move the tropomyosin. And that is where our second regulatory protein calls comes in, troponin. Troponin is a small handle-like protein And this small handle-like protein, when it is motivated to do so, can rotate the tropomyosin out of the way. And of course, when we rotate the tropomyosin out of the way, that exposes the binding site. So if we go back to our pretty picture, Here on top of the troponin are these little handles. And when we need the muscle to contract, we can use these handles to move the regulatory protein out of the way. Now, Moving this tropomyosin out of the way sounds like a pretty wonky process. How do you think we might go about doing this wonky process? Come on, what makes cells do wonky things? Calcium. Calcium, absolutely. And that's exactly what happens. What happens here is that calcium binds to the troponin. Let's make this a little smaller. Calcium binds to the troponin. When it binds to the troponin, troponin undergoes a conformational change. Which is a fancy way of saying what again? What does it mean to undergo a conformational change? Come on, we've done this. Change of shape. Just a fancy way of saying it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, it rotates the tropomycin. Getting it out of the way so that the myosin can now bind onto the actin and do its job. Well, remember, bananas have a large amount of potassium, not calcium, but potassium. And so that potassium does help to maintain the ionic balance in our muscles. So we will talk about cramps and twitches when we get there, but we have to build up to get to that. But remember, it's the, uh, it's the potassium and the vitamin, I mean, the bananas that are so important, not calcium. I mean, they may have calcium too, but it's the potassium that you eat the bananas for. All right, excellent. So we have our two regulatory proteins, we have our two contractile proteins, and a basic idea of how they work. So what that leaves us with is these structural proteins. Now let's start easy with our structural proteins. Notice, and actually I'm going to cheat and go back to this one first. Notice if I just had a rope lying here on the ground and I grabbed it and started pulling on it, that wouldn't change the shape of anything, right? However, if I had it attached to the wall of my house, and as I pulled on the, wall, the rope, the wall of the house moved towards me, then I'd be changing the shape of the room. And so that's what we need to do. Having this actin for our myosin to pull on is all fine and dandy, 
but what I need is a wall for it to pull on. And so as it turns out, these, uh, let's do it this way. These actin filaments are attached to a big, what may look somewhat familiar because we've seen them before, zigzaggy protein that basically, I'll cheat and not write over. Well, okay, apparently I am writing over these things. All right, um, that there, move that. I don't want that there either. I'll just leave it here. You get the idea. There is this big zigzaggy protein that forms the boundaries of my sarcomere. And not, notice, not only would it be the boundary of this sarcomere, but this would also be the boundary of the next one as well. Right? It's like this wall. I have a wall right here, and on the other side of that wall is my daughter's room. Now it's 1118 on a school day. So of course she's asleep in there and me wake, not knocking on the door. Probably, I mean, the wall woke her up. No, she's gone. But that wall both forms the boundary of this room, but also the boundary of her room as well. And so that's what the Z disks do. Basically the Z disks serve two main functions. They define boundaries of the sarcomere. And they're the attachment point for the actin. So they define our sarcomere and they're the attachment point for the actin. Let's go back to our picture. Notice here in our picture, our actin is now stabilized and held in place, but our myosin isn't. We need actually two ways to stabilize this myosin. And the first comes from a special protein uh, that also anchors to the Z disk and has a big coiled component to it. And then it straightens out and kind of runs along the body of the myosin, helping to hold it in place. As I mentioned, this over here is our Z disk. So I need to move my actin now. This protein is actually called titan. It gets its name from the Greek titans. Do you guys remember who the titans were? Remember when we were talking about Atlas, we talked about the titans. The titans were the rulers of the earth before the Greek gods, big, massive creatures. Uh, and like I said, when the uh, Greek gods defeated them, they punished them. Like uh, Sisyphus has to roll the rock up the hill and it keeps coming down. Or uh, Atlas has to hold the world on his shoulders. So these Titans were these huge, massive uh, beings. And at the time that this protein was discovered, it was the largest protein that had been discovered in the body. And so they named it Titan after the Titans. This does a couple things. Notice there are gonna be two of them, one from each side. And they are gonna to help to stabilize the myosin, helping to hold the myosin in place. But notice they have those coiled ends, kind of like kind of like a slinky. And when I extend the slinky out, do I damage it? No. No. Uh, if I took it out long enough, would I be able to damage it? Yeah. 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 But I can stretch it out without damaging it. And when I let it go, what does it do? Restrict or restrict back to its normal shape. 
it goes back to its original shape. Didn't we say muscle tissue had those two characteristics? Where yes. it could be stretched without damage and it could go back to its original shape? Yeah, so not only does this um, titan help to stabilize the myosin, but it also helps to give the muscle cell its elasticity and its extensibility. So we have this titan protein. Like I said, it is the largest protein here, or longest, I guess I should say, which is where it gets its name. Uh, that had been discovered. And like I said, it basically has two jobs. It stabilizes the myosin and it provides the extensibility and the elasticity of the cell. And notice when we look at the illustration, each starts at one end and then they meet in the middle. One doesn't go all the way across from one side to the other, they actually meet in the middle, which actually brings us to our last protein. Our last protein is not one, not two, but three rows of interlocking proteins located in the midline of our sarcomere. These three lines of interlocking proteins are what are known as the myomycin, And this myomycin not only stabilizes the myosin in this myofibril, but this is the one that extends to other myofibrils in the cell, keeping everything perfectly aligned. So this myomycin protein It's like I said, three rows of interlocking proteins. They help to stabilize the myosin. Remember we said two proteins did that, stabilize the myosin, but they also stabilize all of the myofibrils. So that remember, when we look at the muscle cell, all of the myosin lines up all of the Z discs line up, all of the actin lines up, and this is what gives the muscle its stripes. It gets the stripes because this myomycin perfectly aligns the proteins so that everything lines up in a perfect row so that some areas have darker proteins, thicker proteins, some areas have thinner proteins, and it gives the muscle cell its stripes. All right, we have done this here on the whiteboard, both here in words and also with the pretty pictures. But let's look at the pictures from your textbook. Notice here we see that dimer, that is the myosin. Notice we have a single myosin here with its two entwined tails and those two heads they come together to form that thick filament that is the myosin filament with hundreds of myosin heads on it. And like we said, these myosin heads are motors. They use ATP and they convert into mechanical energy. They produce that pivot, that power stroke where the head basically pivots. Actin, here we see an actin filament. The actin is in blue here. Again, notice it is made up of dimers. And as we see, those dimers have the 
binding sites, those active sites for the myosin to bind to. So notice all along this thread, we see all of those binding sites for the myosin. Now on this particular actin filament, can the myosin actually get to the actin? Can it get to this binding site right here? No. No, because notice there are these two other pesky proteins in the way. The long thread-like tropomyosin and then the handle-like troponin. So notice this also shows us our two regulatory proteins. One of the things that I love that your book has done a really nice job of doing is giving us these views from an electron microscope. When we look in a mic light microscope, we can't even see most of the organelles. We can see the nucleus when we look in a light microscope, but we can't see the Golgi apparatus or the rough endoplasmic reticulum or anything along those lines. But when we use an electron microscope, we can actually see the individual proteins. And that's what you're seeing here. Notice we have these big, huge, thick myosin uh, proteins. Notice the myosin proteins have their myosin heads coming off of them. And these thick myosin filaments, we can see are grabbing a hold of that thinner actin. And we can see they, in, they overlap with each other. Interlocking, myosin actin, myosin actin, myosin actin. We can see this really nicely here in the electron microscope. But notice the other place we can see this really nicely is when we go back to those pictures from the classroom. Notice in the classroom, there's their muscle cell model and a second muscle cell model. But there is actually a model of a sarcomere in the classroom as well. Notice here, our model of the sarcomere actually has a cover that wraps around it. Notice that cover has this kind of interlacing uh, green mesh that wraps around the sarcomere. What do you think that might represent? If only I'd learned about a thin mesh-like substance that, rocked, that wrapped around the myofibrils. Maybe if it helps that if I point out to you that notice at the end here, it enlarges to a bigger thickened portion. Sarcoplasmic reticulum? Yeah, this represents the sarcoplasmic reticulum and this thickened portion would be what? The... What do we call the thickened end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Um, terminal cisternae. Terminal cisternae. And notice there are two terminal cisternae with this yellow line in between them. What do you think this yellow line? There you go, Sarah, to mm -hmm. the punch. So that yellow line represents the transverse tubule. And so then, of course, these three things together would represent uh, what? The triad. Excellent. Notice though, we can peel, oh, then say so there we see that. We can peel that off, and here we see our sarcomer. Notice we can see most, not all, but most of the proteins uh, that we want to identify. Let's start easy. What protein would this be here in red? The Z disc. Z disc. What would this protein here in black with the little blue dots coming off of it be? Actin? Well, myosin. Those are the myosin, myosin? heads. Yeah, those little, I didn't want to say head because that would make it too obvious. Yeah, those little, those little hands sticking off of it are the myosin head. Notice at the midline, there is a protein here stabilizing all the myosins in place. What might that be? The myomycin. Myomycin, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Notice there are these red globular proteins that are attached to the Z-disc. What might that be? So that's the titan? Nope, that's the one thing that's missing. 
Notice these red things are two globe-like structures, ball-like structures uh, that are attached to the uh, Z-disc. Notice is it the, the tropin, troponin? It's the actin. It's actin. What the myosin head is trying to grab onto. However, notice there are these yellow lines on the actin. What do you think these yellow lines represent? The tripomyosin. Tripomyosin. And notice myosin. one yellow lines. Uh, again, I don't care how you pronounce it as long as you uh, spell it correctly. What do you think these green globular hand type, handle type things on the yellow lines would be? Proponent. 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 So notice the only thing this is missing is the uh, titan. The titan, if we had it, would basically attach to the Z-disc, would come off in a coil, would run along the side of the myosin and would attach to the, uh, would attach to the myomycin at the center. So that's the only thing that's missing from this, but it does this great job of showing it. And notice now we can see an entire sarcomere. That entire sarcomere is from Z-disc to Z-disc with that myomycin at the midline, the thick filament of the myosin, the actin filaments, and then those regulatory proteins on them. And just like a real sarcomere, this model is adjustable. So this can move inward and outward, making it small, shorter, and longer, just like a muscle would contract. So we see this really nicely on the models, and we see this really nicely on the electron microscope as well. Now, here, we see those two regulatory proteins. Again, the tropomyosin, which is the long thread-like one that blocks the binding site. And the troponin, the handle that is going to change its shape to move that regulatory protein out of the way. And remind me again, what makes it change its shape? Calcium, there you go, excellent. Lastly, here we see our three regulatory proteins. Again, we have the boundaries that are the Z-disc. Again, the boundary of one wall forming one sarcomere here and then the beginning of another sarcomere off that way. Here we see that big extensible and elastic titan securing the myosin in place and also providing the extensibility and elasticity. And even though it only shows one line, remember our myomycin is those three interlocking proteins that show these as well. Stabilize this myomycin, pardon me, stabilize the myosin and all of the myofibrils together. All right, so far so good. Now, notice we have looked at all these things longitudinally, but would it be possible to take a myofibril and take a cross section and look at the ends of it? Yeah, and be able yes. to see the different proteins. And notice, depending on where you made that section, you would see different proteins. Remember, as we've talked about, this precise arrangement of the proteins is what gives our muscle its stripes. The dark stripe and the light stripe, or what we call the dark band and the light band. Now, a couple important things here. Our dark band is, of course, the dark called the dark band because it is the part that has the dense proteins in them. It is called the A band because of the German word, because this was first described by some German anatomists. But even though it's not the reason it has this name, what I find incredibly convenient is that A for A band, and there's an A in dark. Now, 
what is the thickest filament? Myosin. Myosin. Oh. So the A band is the portion of the sarcomere. that contains myosin. So notice on our illustration here, from the end of the myosin here, all the way to the end of the myosin here, and actually let's do this easier. From the end of the myosin here to the end of the myosin there, that would be the dark band or what we call the A band. So the light band is basically gonna be the part that does not myosin. And notice while the A band is in the center, sarcomere, our I band actually crosses the Z disc. Our light band is going to go from the edge of the myosin on this sarcomere all the way to the edge of the myosin on the next one. And then once we get to the myosin of the next one, then that's when we'll have our next dark band and so on and so forth. We have this alternating pattern of dark and light stripes based on whether you have myosin or whether you do not have myosin. And really the stripes are really just that simple. The part that contains myosin is the A band. The part that does not contain myosin is the I band. And notice conveniently enough, I for I band, I in light. Again, not how they got their names, not dark A band because A is in dark and I band because I is in I, in light, but it's a great easy mnemonic to remember what's what. All right, so far so good. Now it can't truly be just that simple, can it? No, of course not. Because notice there's some other big proteins here. For instance, the Z disc, do you think that'd be something we could see under the microscope? Yeah, and so the, that big, huge Z disc protein forms a region that's probably too thin to be a band. So it is called the Z line. And Notice we also have this very thick myomesin interwinding with the actin on the midline. So that would be convenient to call this the M line. But there's one other thing that I wanna point out to you. Notice here in the, let's use a black line for this. Actually, let's see, yeah, white line might work now. Repeat. Here in the A band, notice there is some parts of the A band where myosin and actin overlap. But there's also a portion of the A band that just has myosin. The part of the A band that just contains myosin, we call the H band. Notice, we have all these regions and they're defined by the proteins. So remember, as we talked about, if we were to take a cross section through these, notice for instance, if we were to take a cross section of this in the A band, pardon me, in the I band, we would just see actin. However, 
if we took it in the middle of the A band, what proteins would we see? Actin and myosin. We would see actin and myosin. But what if we took it in the area in the H band? Myosin. We would just see myosin. And if we were to take it right on the midline, on that M line where the myosin and the myomycin interact, we would see those interlocking myomycin proteins stabilizing and holding the myosin in place. Notice, not only do we see this really nicely on our illustration, but notice if we go back to our oops, muscle cell model, notice with the muscle cell model, our myofibrils have been cut at different heights. So when we look at it straight on from the top, Notice we can see an area that just has thick filaments in it. What would that area be? What region of the organelle? So let's do this. Let's do this. Band. Hold on. Yeah. Let's make sure that this makes sense. So let's label all of these first. We'll call this one A, this one B, this one C, this one D, all right? So, because again, we want to think in terms of how this is going to be asked on the exam. So on the exam, I could have a star on any of those and I could ask you to just define the region of the organelle now, of course, remind me, what organelles are these? All four of these things, what are they? What, are, what organelles are these? I can tell your brains are getting full. This is our myofibrils. So the regions of the organelles, we have A, we have B, we have C, and we have D. Excellent. What would the region of the organelle that was A be? Yes. True, okay, A band is accurate, but we can also be more specific. M line, H band. H band, absolutely. This is the H band. And how do we know this is the H band? Because there's only myosin. Now you are correct, the H band is within the A band, but we can be more specific. So we always wanna be as specific as we can. So you get partial credit for A band, but for full credit, we wanna say this is the H band. And it's the H band because it only contains myosin. What's B? B, M, M, M line. M line, excellent. And how did we know that? Because of this. Access. The center. The center. Yeah, the myosin with the interlocking uh, myomycin. So we have that interlocking mesh makes it super easy. What would C be? C I band. I band. And how did you know that? Because there's only thin filaments yeah. or actin. Only that thin actin filament only. And then what would D be? The A band. All right, because here notice we have thick and thin, or more specifically, myosin and actin. And so you. would we get full credit for saying A band or I band, or do you want to add all of it? No, I, if I ask you for the region uh -huh. of the organelle, then your answer is going to be H band, M line, A mm -hmm. band, or I band, right? That's the answer. 
-hmm. I am writing the proteins to remind us of why we knew that was the correct answer. So you wouldn't have to say A band actin only. You would just, if I asked you to identify the region of the organelle, you would just say I band. Okay. Excellent. Notice the models show this really great. The illustrations from your textbook show this really great. But notice also, uh, here's another illustration that does a great job of showing this. So again, M line is where the myomycin is right on the midline. Let me cheat and put that on the midline. I was trying to make it thinner so that we could see the myomycin. There we go, perfect. H band is the part that just has myosin. A band has the overlap and it's really, the, notice the M line and the H band are inside the A band. I band and Z line, we have all of those. And again, all of these illustrations show this nicely, but when we look at a real cell under a real electron microscope, we can see this as well. Notice here, we can very clearly see the Z disks forming the Z lines. We can very easily see the dark band, the A band, and what makes the A band so dark again? Myosin. It contains myosin. Whereas notice the I band does not contain myosin, so it is much lighter in color. However, if you look closely, you will notice that the color of the A band is not uniform. There is a thin layer in the middle that is a little lighter than out here, because out here we have both actin and myosin together, whereas in this region here, what do we have? Just myosin. And so this region is what we call the H band. And notice also, if you look really closely, right at the midline, you can see where those three lines of, uh, of myomycin interact to form the M line. Here is another colorized electron microscopy view. And what I like about this is here, you can actually see that we're not looking at one, but actually two myofibrils. Now notice these myofibrils are almost perfectly aligned, but they're not perfectly aligned. Does that mean in the muscle, they were not perfectly aligned? No, it was just the way that- um, Yeah. Think about, yeah, think about what we have to do to look at something with an electron microscope. First, we have to take a muscle and cut a piece of that muscle out. Then we have to freeze that muscle. Then we have to, once it's frozen, use a very sharp blade to cut off a 25 micron slice of that tissue, which we then have to put in some different solutions, put it on a slide, put it in the electron microscope and bombard it with electrons that actually destroy the tissue as it's getting the images. So with all of that processing, is it not surprising that maybe the myofibrils have become slightly misaligned because of that? Yeah, that's not unreasonable to think about. But notice we can still clearly see the sarcomere from Z-disc to Z-disc. We can clearly see the difference between the IA band and the I band. We can see the lighter H zone and we can see the M line smack down in the middle. And in fact, we saw all of these things in our original picture as well. Remember, even under the light microscope, we were able to easily tell the difference between the dark stripe and the light stripe. So we can see the part that contains myosin and the part that doesn't contain myosin. But remember how we saw this dark line in the center of our light stripe, what we now know is the I band. What is that dark line at the center of our I band? The H on the H. Well, the Z disc? It's the Z disc. Remember, it's the Z disc. So remember, our sarcomere goes from Z disc to Z disc, and we can actually see that Z disc protein. And remember, if you look really closely, right in the center of the A band, you can see an area that's a little bit lighter in color. 
that would be the H band. Now, with a light microscope, are we going to see the M line? Are we going to see the myomesin right there in the center? No, no. but we can kind of see that little bit of lightness where it's just myosin. We can see that little bit of an H band right there in the center of the A band. And again, we can see how all of these things, the Z disc from one perfectly aligns with the Z disc of the next, which perfectly aligns with the Z disc of the next. And so for all four muscle cells, all of our stripes are perfectly aligned. All right, questions on that? All right, so I know we've done a lot of heavy lifting today, getting down to these simplest, most basic building blocks of the muscle cell. We started with a muscle like the bicep brachia, and now we're talking about the tiny little individual proteins that we can see on these models. Notice if we take this model and turn it back up right, we can see all of these things we were just talking about. Notice this pink right here is our Z-disc from uh, Z-disc to Z-disc. So there's one sarcomere. Right. Notice here are the three lines of myomycin at the center. We can see the thick actin filaments. I mean, uh, myosin filaments. We can see the thin actin filaments, which connect to the Z-disc. We can see all of these sarcomers. Notice there is a second model that shows a muscle as well. Notice it doesn't cut the myofibrils at different lengths, and it doesn't even show the proteins nearly as well. We can clearly see the dark stripe and the light stripe, but notice it's kind of put this weird thing in the center, which I guess is supposed to represent either the H band or the M line, and then something similar here at the center here, which I guess is supposed to be the Z disc. So we can still go sarcomere to sarcomere. It's not the best that way. But notice it's got great transverse tubules and excellent sarcoplasmic reticulum and uh, terminal cisternae. So we see our uh, triad here. So we see all of those things really nicely on this as well. So again, it's a good model. Notice this one has a nice um, sarcolemma, but no satellite cell out here like the other model does. Both of these are things that would be on the exam. We can see that. And again, we saw that perfect alignment of all these things in our proteins of this here as well. But now that we know the proteins, we can talk about how they all work together. All right. Now, this is the longest physiological process we are going to have in this class. The process of contracting a muscle is the longest physiological process we can have. It starts with what? If I have a muscle I want to contract, where does that begin? In the brain. In the brain. I have to make the conscious decision. And if I want to move my right finger, where do I actually make that decision? Your left side of your brain? Yeah, left side. so over here on the left side of the brain, I make the decision that I want to contract that muscle and eventually that muscle contracts, right? So this is the, the muscle contraction is the longest continuous process that we will study in this class. And if it's gonna be the longest, we wanna break it up into three more easily digestible pieces. Again, it's normally a continuous process. So we're artificially doing this. Into three major steps. But it's important to remember that this is a continuous process. So if you think about it, or, or let's say it this way, three major phases. However, let's think about this. The last step 
of phase one, guess what else it is? More phases. Yeah. First step of phase two. Right. Because it's a continuous process, basically where one of these processes end is where the next one is going to begin. So we're kind of artificially doing this because it's a continuous process, but rather than having to learn it all together, we're going to break it up into three pieces. And did we just do it randomly, just closed our eyes and slapped it twice and got three pieces? No. 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 We're going to do this in a meaningful fashion. So for each of these phases, we are going to, or for these three processes, we are going to give it a name and we're going to identify the goal of all of these. Now, the first step in this process is what we call communication at the neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction is a specialized structure that we'll talk about more in depth in the next class. Where we're basically, as the name indicates, we have to combine neural information into muscular information. This is where we where we're going to stimulate the muscle cell. Now, when we think of terms of our goal here for this, remember we started with the decision. And when we made the decision, our brain produced a big electrical signal. Any idea what we might call that big electrical signal? Action potential. An action potential. So we start with a neural action potential. And we wanna use it to stimulate our muscle cell because our muscle cell is irritable. And when our muscle cell is irritated, what does it do? It reacts. It reacts by doing what? Contracting. Before it contracts, remember when we said it was irritable, we also said it was electrically excitable. Because when it's stimulated, what does it do? Produce. Produces. Energy. Energy. Well, it produces an action potential. Oh, action. Oh. A muscle action potential. And so that's what we're going to do here at the neuromuscular junction. Here at the neuromuscular junction, we have to convert the neural action potential. into a muscle action potential. And this can't just happen anywhere. It has to happen someplace special. And that someplace special is the neuromuscular junction. So start, step one in this process is gonna be communication at the neuromuscular junction. We're going to stimulate the muscle cell, and our goal is to convert the neural action potential into the muscle action potential. Now, step two is called excitation, contraction, coupling. What does it mean to couple? Combine. Yeah, to combine or to bring things together. And what do you think the things we need to bring together are here? The myosin? Well, again, it's the excitation contraction coupling. So guess what the th two things we need to bring together are? Excited electrical. Yeah. Electrical. Ab absolutely. Remember, at the end of step one, we've generated a muscle action potential. But as you guys pointed out, we want the muscle to contract. And so that's what we need to do. We need to basically, what we have to do here is we have to use that electrical activity, use that action potential to get the muscle to contract. And remind me again, why the muscle isn't contracting all the time? We're not using it all the time? 
Yeah, but myosin wants to grab and pull on the actin all the time. So why am I not in a constant state of contraction? Because there's a blocking thing. Yeah, and what blocks it again? Oh, well, it's the troponin and tropomyosin, but collectively, what did we call them? Uh, Starts with an R, you're right, on the right path. Regulatory proteins. Regulatory proteins, absolutely. And so that's our goal. Here, our goal in step two, our goal of the excitation contraction coupling is to move the regulatory proteins. So the myosin and actin can interact. We want the myosin and actin to interact. We want to get the contraction, but all we have is this electrical signal. And remind me again, what did we say we were going to use to move those regulatory proteins? ETP. Well, ATP is going to give us the contraction, but remember, moving the regulatory proteins, getting the muscle to contract is a wonky thing. Calcium. There we go. So we're going to use that calcium to move those regulatory proteins. And actually, let's write it that way. We're going to use calcium. Our goal is to use calcium to move the regulatory proteins so that the myosin and the actin can interact. Once those pesky regulatory proteins are out of the way, then we can finally get to the third process. And that third process is called the contractile cycle. Now, key word there being cycle. What does cycle mean? Comes back around. And yeah, it's again. a continuous it's process. Continuous. Where it's going to go around and around in the ground. This is also sometimes referred to as the sliding filament theory. Because what happens is the myosin and the actin slide across each other. And as they slide across each other, that changes the shape of the muscle cell. That generates the tension that produces the force. So contractile cycle or sliding filament theory are both acceptable terms for phase three. And as we just mentioned, our goal is to allow the myosin and actin to interact. We're going to do this to change the length of the muscle cell. And when we change the length of the muscle cell, we generate a force, or we can say we produce a tension. And that force, that tension is what moves the body in space. So I start with the decision and ultimately the muscle contracts. One continuous process that we're going to divide into three more easily digestible pieces. So this is just like a summary of each phase. Yes, obviously we're gonna go through all of the steps of these phases, of these processes, but this is the overview of what we're gonna spend the next probably three days in class talking about. Really? Yep, well actually two, only two. Two whole lectures talking about this. All righty. Now, if there was a fourth step, what do you think that fourth step would be? The muscle relaxing. Yeah, yeah. right. Once I contract the muscle, I don't want to contract forever. So we could think of step four as relaxation. Or we could think of it as another way. To get the muscle to contract, we have to turn these processes on. So if we wanted to relax, what would we have to do? Turn them off. Yeah. Okay. 
And would that be using like the regulatory proteins? Not necessarily. No, yeah, only for step two, because only step two involves the regulatory proteins. Okay. So when we go through each of these processes, we will talk about how to turn it on, how to initiate the process. And we will also talk about how to terminate the process. Does that go back to like uh, communicating the communication part portion of it? Yep. Yeah, because again, when I can, I make the decision to contract the muscle and to get the muscle to relax, I have to make the decision again to relax the muscle. So yeah, it all starts with the decision. It all starts, every, all of these start. You've absolutely got the right idea. The very first step of both of these is mental. You have to make the conscious decision that you want to contract the muscle. And that's where all of this is going to begin. It's going to start first with that decision. So, like I said, for the next two or three lectures, this is going to be our game plan. Going through this and making sure that we understand all of these three steps, how to turn them on, how to turn them off. And we may even play with modifying them to really show that we understand. But this is going to be the game plan for lecture. We also need a game plan for lab. And that game plan for lab is this right here. Your handout, this is essentially almost entirely what your lab exam is going to be on. In class, we are going to work together to uh, understand the muscles you are responsible for, the actions you are responsible for. Notice using the terms that we've talked about. So for instance, notice the first muscle on this list is the masseter and it elevates the mandible. What does that mean? Closes your mouth. Yeah, brings it up, there you go closes the mouth. That's a common way to describe that. So if I ask you for the action of the masseter on the exam, are you going to say that it closes the mouth? No, it's mandible. No, you need to make sure that you use the appropriate anatomical terms. But notice these include things like flexing, like rotating, right? Like elevating, like depressing, right? These are the terms that we've used. And these are the terms that we're going to continue to use. Lateral flex, all of those things are things that we have talked about. These are terms that we are familiar with from the last section. So for every single muscle on your list, and again, if you think about it, you have 600 muscles in your body, over 600 muscles in your body. How many of the muscles of your head and neck are you responsible for? Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. Do you think there's only ten muscles in your head and neck? No. No, but these are the ones that you are responsible for. Why are there dashes under origin? I'm getting to that. Sorry. So notice <laughs> on your list, you are responsible for all of the muscles and all of the actions. Notice some of these just have one action. Some of them may have two, some of them may have three, some of them may even have four. If a muscle has four actions, how many of those actions do you need to know? Four. Uh -huh. Four of them, excellent. However, you will also notice that some of the muscles are bold. If they are bold, notice those bold muscles also have origins and insertions listed. Origins and insertions are the attachment points. For the muscles. 
all the bolded muscles, you are responsible for knowing the origins and the insertions. As was so cleverly pointed out, you will notice that some of these muscles don't have origins and insertions listed for them. Does that mean they do not have origins and insertions? No. No, of course they have origins and insertions. What it means is you are not responsible for them. So for those muscles, you just need to know their names and their actions, and obviously where they are on the body and their actions. But all of the bold muscles, you need to know the origins and the insertions. And notice only five of your 10 head and neck muscles do you need to know the origins and the insertions for. So as intimidating as this may seem, it's not as bad as it feels. We are going to go through these together. All right. We are going to go through these together, uh, identifying these. And if you'll notice, there is another important handout in your uh, modules. It shows bones because after all, these bones and bone features we just learned, as I mentioned, we didn't randomly pick them out of a hat. I picked them because they were things we were going to be using. So for instance, for the masseter, you are responsible for its two attachment points, the origin and the insertion. By convention, And again, remember, by convention just simply means a rule that, some, that a bunch of anatomists got together and made up. Origins are colored red and insertions are colored blue. So for class on Monday, you are going to want to print out this handout. Or if you like to do it digitally, you can have it on your iPad. Uh, but if you print these out, you need a red pen and a blue pen. Because what we're gonna do is using that list and using what we know of our bones, we're gonna draw the origins and the insertions. Since we just mentioned the masseter, what is the origin of the masseter? The psychomatic arch. Which, so I, again, because it's the origin, I will color it in red. Make that a little bigger. So there is my zygomatic arch. And what is its insertion? The mandibular angle. There you go. Two bone figures we know, and now we've labeled them on here. This is convenient because one of the things that we'll learn and we'll talk about more in the next class is when a muscle contracts, it pulls the insertion towards the origin. So notice when our masseter contracts, it is going to pull the insertion towards the origin, which is basically pulling the mandible straight up. And what would we call that action? Elevate. Elevate the mandible. So notice one of the advantages of drawing these things is we can actually see how it's going to function. And that is something that is incredibly useful. Also, that means that on this exam, and I would say probably 20 to 25% of this exam, that sounds like a lot, let's say 20, somewhere around 20% would probably be a good guess. Uh, there are gonna be bone pictures. So on the exam, could I have a skull sitting here on the table? And could I have this skull feature identified? So a big arrow pointing to this skull feature right here. And on the exam, can I say, identify the muscle that originates from this skull feature? Yeah. And what yeah. would your answer to that be? 
Yeah, it'd be the no, not I didn't, the ask, what the, I didn't ask you what this skull feature was. I asked you to identify the muscle that originates oh. from this skull. Oh, masseter. Masseter, right? Oh. Notice also I could point here, identify the muscle that inserts into this bone feature. And what would you say? Masseter. Masseter, right? So like I said, probably somewhere around 20% of the exam will be bones. So you need to know your bones and bone features. Now, drawing this is a great way to learn it, but there's another great way to learn this stuff as well. And again, I'm assuming at this point, you guys are absolutely positively familiar and comfortable with your my lab and mastering. If not, first and foremost, shame on you. But secondly, uh, where am I going? There. Study area. Practice anatomy lab. This is one of the things that you should have been using for your bones. Notice this also has muscular system in our cadaver. So for instance, you can go to the upper limb and you can see some of these muscles we've been talking about, or uh, like the bicep brachia or something along those lines. And again, you can go through the different layers and the cadaver is interesting, it's useful, but notice anatomical models, muscular system, upper limb, Notice now we see models just like we have in the classroom, just like the models you'd be responsible for. And notice, lo and behold, there on the arm is that bicep brachia we've been talking about. As you start to feel comfortable with these, there are quizzes where we'll point at a muscle. Now, again, you have 600 named muscles in the body. Is it possible that your quiz could show you one of the muscles you're not responsible for? Yes. Yeah. And if it does, do you care? No. No. Just go on to the next one. Find one where it does show something you're responsible for, right? Or if you're feeling particularly frisky, you can go to the lab practical where it will show you a muscle and you have to actually type in the answer. So it's a good way to learn this material here. However, if you also look up at the top, there are animations. Can I also suggest something? Yep, in a second. Okay. Biceps brachii is the large two-headed flexor muscle located in the anterior Can you guys hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Compartment of the arm. The origin of the long head is from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The origin of the short head is from the tip of the coracoid process of the scapula. The two heads insert by a common tendon onto the radial tuberosity and by the bicipital aponeurosis, which blends with the deep fascia on the medial aspect of the forearm. Biceps brachii flexes the forearm at the elbow supinates the forearm, and weakly flexes the shoulder. It is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. So notice the amazing thing about this animation is it showed us the two origins for the two heads. It showed us the insertion, and it showed us the action. So if you look at your list for the bicep brachia, you see the three actions are flexing the shoulder, flexing the elbow, and supinating the hand. So it is a great tool to help you for this. Were you going to uh, encourage me to go to the flashcards? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In the study area, there is the practice anatomy lab flashcards, where again, using the anatomical models, going to the muscular system, uh, for instance, of the upper limb or, and the head or the neck, you can then actually select the 10 muscles you're responsible for. So I'm responsible for that one. I'm responsible for that one and that one. I'm also responsible for this one and this one. And so on and so forth. You can see all of the muscles here. 
that you're responsible for. And you can review and quiz where it will show you these things and you have to see whether or not you get them right. So you can try to guess what that is and flip to see if you get it correct. I think that's the uh, temporalis, wrong, right? Exactly. And so you can get and go through these things and learn that. So it is a great tool and a great resource. And I believe these flashcards can actually also be downloaded onto your mobile app, uh, phones. So you can actually download flashcards there. Into the flashcards, uh, there is a uh, somewhere in here. There he is mobile flashcards. So you can actually make mobile flashcards that you're actually able to use on your phone as well. So again, if you've not used these resources already, please start because these are the things that are going to help you to be successful in this section. All right. So literally for the next two weeks, that's going to be our game plan. During lecture, we're going to talk about how a muscle contracts and all the physiology. And then, oh, that's the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about. The last thing is to um, have your red and blue pen because we're going to also in lab look at origins, insertion, and actions. The last thing that I wanted to talk about and something you should be uh, thinking about and working on between now and Monday is that muscle activity handout. The muscle activity handout is a tool to help you study this material. Right? We just talked about the masseter. The master has one action to elevate the mandible. And as you guys pointed out, while the action is to elevate the mandible, an activity that would help us to remember that is to, like you guys said, close your mouth. Right? So if I can remember to associate that activity, closing your mouth with the masseter, then it helps me to remember it. Now, obviously, a muscle that just has one action isn't necessarily going to need an activity to help you to remember it. However, and I will share with you my all-time favorite, one of the things that we're going to talk about in the next class is the sternocleidomastoid. As the name indicates, it's got three attachment points to the sternum, to the mastoid process, and to the clavicle. And how many actions does the sternocleidomastoid have? Oh, wait, well, somebody looks at the list. Three. Three. Read them off to me one at a time. What's the first one? What's the first activity on the list? And the first action on the list. The action, uh, flex head. Okay. So you have two sternocleidomastoids. So when you contract them both at the same time, it basically brings your head down. It flexes your head, All right? It's often called the prayer muscle because it would like bow your head in prayer. What else? Elevate your, elevate sternum. Excellent. If I hold my head in place with other muscles, normally we said how the insertion goes towards the origin. However, if I use other muscles to stabilize my head in place, then when I contract that muscle, instead of my head going down, my ribs come up. And what's the third action? Rotate head. Notice if I just contract one of these, it would rotate my head. So notice those are three actions to that muscle. And it can be hard to associate them together. We're not in the classroom, so you guys are getting off easy. Because if we were in the classroom, I'd be breaking you up into groups. I would be assigning you muscles. And starting on Monday, you would, when I, after we identified a muscle, you would have to stand up and demonstrate an activity that is going to help us to remember all of those actions. And so I think it was like my second year at AR. This was like 12 years ago or something crazy like that. A uh, very long time ago, uh, well before it was legal in California, I had this sweet, uh, uh, quiet, you know, serene student who sat in the back of the, quiet, the class, was all quiet, was all uh, innocent looking. And she stood up to demonstrate her activity for the sternocleidomastoid, which she called her terms a bong rip. Right, flex the head, 
Elevate the rib cage. <sighs> Rotate the head. So there you go. You have those three activities all together in that one action of that muscle. And now none of you will ever forget the three actions of the sternocleidomastoid because you will always now associate the sternocleidomastoid with a bong rip. And you will remember that it flexes the head, elevates the rib cage and rotates the head. And that's what that handout is about. Notice there's two ways. I've given you muscles and I want you to come up with your own activities and notice silly, stupid activities like a bong rip is an easy way to remember these things. I've also given you some common activities that you then have to figure out what muscle produces that. So what muscle, and then it give me the correct names for the actions. Because again, on the exam, if I ask you to identify the three actions of the sternocleidomastoid, you can't say bong rip, <laughs> right? That's just your trick to help you to remember the three actions, the flexing of the head, the elevating of the sternum, and the rotating of the head. All right. So that's one of the things that I want you to start thinking about. Obviously, you need to learn the actions first, but as you're going through the, the, and learning these actions, then look at that activity list and see if you can kind of start working these things together. And even ones that have multiple actions on it that may not be on that list, you might want to come up with these types of activities to help you to remember them when it comes to the exam. All right. So that is the game plan for the next couple of weeks. Any questions on that? All right. And that is all I have for you today. Have a good busy weekend. Uh, please remember to bring a red pen and a blue pen on, uh, on Monday. But like I said, I guess we're at home. So even if you forget during our first break, you'll be able to go and grab them. But it's a good thing to have those things print out your uh, handout so that you're ready for that when we meet. All right, guys, have a great day and a great weekend, and I will see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.